in Matthew 24, the main point that we need to bear in mind is that in this chapter, we are focusing on three different time periods. Three different periods of time. Well, at least two and possibly three. I say possibly, and I'll explain why I say possibly in a moment. But clearly, Matthew 24 is focusing on several periods of time. And what, what I would like us all to keep in mind is that this is not the, the only prophecy like this in the Bible. And it's not the only prophecy by Jesus, which is like this. It, he, he gives you a prophecy and he, he, he states events that will take place. But when you look at those events, they cover, some apply in one period of time and some apply in another mm -hmm. period of time. It's the same prophecy. But some of the things do not apply to one period of time. They apply to a later period and other things apply to that first period and not to the later period. So what I'm saying is that the, the, the inside of that one prophecy, there are two different prophecies combined and they are combined in such a way that they can be confusing. I know that in this fellowship, we have looked at some examples of this before, especially as we looked at some Old Testament prophecies, we saw that some some of the things that are said in those Old Testament prophecies cannot apply to the end of time. And some of the things apply to the end of time and they did not apply in the time of the Jews. So many of these prophecies have a, an application to the time of, of the, the, the Hebrews and also to the end of time. And the Bible writers did not make a distinction. They put everything, well, it, it wasn't the Bible writers. I believe it was God's method. He put everything in one prophecy. So you have a problem now to discover what applies to my time and what applied to the time of the Jews. And if we take the words of Jesus, he points out that this was by design. You know, God designed the prophecies, even the Bible in general, but especially the prophecies in such a way that it takes spiritual discernment to understand. In other words, it is God's device for blocking the careless and the unbelieving and those who are not really sincere in their search for truth. You know, in, in, our, in our time when we are looking, when, when one of our, our concerns is to win an argument, let me put it that way. One of, one of the things, when we get into a discussion, one of the things is to win an argument. In this kind of situation, it's a little unsatisfying to think of it this way. Sister um, Janice, I don't know if she's in the room, but she sent me a list of, um, of verses, a whole long list of verses that seem to teach predestination. And she was just, you know, she was just asking, how would I respond to these verses? Now, she doesn't believe in predestination and neither do I, but there are verses in the Bible that, that seem to speak of predestination. And, you know, what I said was sometimes to arrive at the truth, you can't just look at one verse in isolation or even two verses in isolation. You can look at particular verses and, and teach that God will roast sinners forever. There are certain things that you have to bring to bear uh, in looking at, 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 a, at the volume of it. And you have to look at the principle. How did they express things in their day? And when they said it in their time, what did they mean? You have to look at context principle. And sometimes even that doesn't give you the full, the full answer. But the point is, there is enough in the Bible to confuse people who are not really sincere in their search for truth. And God is not con uh, concerned about winning arguments with unbelievers. That God is not concerned about this. I mean, he puts evidence in his word that he says, the sincere person who is looking for truth, they can see the evidence and they can, they can come to correct conclusions. But for the unbeliever, there are enough, enough pillars on which to hang their doubts. And God designs it this way because while truth builds up and convicts those who have honest hearts, 
who have a heart towards God. The same truth hardens and cements the person who doesn't want to believe. The same truth, he finds reasons to be skeptical. And God designs it this way. Because God, God has not sown the truth to win arguments or to, or to stimulate the senses of those who are not really sincere in their attitude towards him. You know, I, I saw an article in the Jamaican newspaper a, a few days ago. I mean, I, I read the article and I was so tempted to, to, to write some scathing comments and I saw some, some you know, what he said, what he says really, it, it was talking about was the resurrection real? And this guy's an atheist and he, he goes to talk about this, this story about Jesus and the miracles were made up by the disciples and there's nobody outside of uh, Matthew and Mark, nobody outside who, who really comments on this, only these people. And he says that the book of Acts was invented by Luke and, and the story about Paul being converted under the, under Damascus Road. He says this, this was something that Luke made up and put there. Look, he's speaking with authority, this complete idiot. Speaking with authority as though he, 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 he knows these things for facts. And there come some people afterwards commenting and commending him for this rubbish. And I was so incensed and I, I, th I thought to get on and write. And, I'm think and then I thought, what is the point? This is not going to help these lunatics at all. And, and, and truth is not for people like this. Truth is not for people who are so blind. And, and I mean, blind is hardly the, uh, an adequate word. but. You come up with some, you, you, you write things like this totally without any kind of evidence. I mean, you look at the same evidence and they look at the evidence and these crazy people come up to, with conclusions like this because it is the condition of the heart, not the ability of the mind. This fellow is some, some doctor, he's a medical doctor, right? He, 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 it's not the condition of the, of the, the, or the ability of the mind. It's a state of the heart. And so the Bible is written like this and God designs it like this. It's something we need to understand. Sometimes it's really frustrating when you see the truth as clear as crystal and you try to share it and you can't break through. You can't get through. It's frustrating. People only find reasons to be skeptical when you see truth so clearly. But I, I, I will, will say, Comfort yourself in this realization that God designed the Bible that way. It's not to win arguments. It's to convince, uh, convict sincere people. And so in this, in this prophecy in Matthew 24, we see an example of this. We see where Jesus told one prophecy in a straight story, one timeline, a straight story. If you try to follow Matthew 24 and take it as a straight expression of the destruction of Jerusalem, you end up in great confusion. If you try to take it, take it, take it as an expression of the end of time, you end up in, in, in equally great con, uh, confusion. It can't fit. The parts can't fit. Some fit 80, 70. Some fit the end of the world. And yet Jesus told it as one continuous straight story. So, so we need to bear this in mind, and we need to bear this in mind many times in reading the Bible. So a, 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 legal, a person with a legalistic mindset and somebody who likes to fit everything into his, his comfortable little box will say, we don't understand Matthew 24 because this part says this, and this part says this. We're, 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 it's not fitting together correctly. He's right. But the problem is not that there are there are difficulties in, in Matthew 24. The problem is there are difficulties in the way this person is looking at the Bible. Let me go to, to Matthew 24. Let me go to the chapter and give you straight away um, an example of what I mean. Matthew 24. We, we, we pick up right where we stopped the last time because that's right about the point we were at last week and I want to highlight it. All right, so 
we can look at verse 20, for example. Verse 20. Verse 20 says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. All right, does that apply to the end of time? Well, there, there are many people who apply it to the end of time. But if, if, you, if you think about it carefully, you will see that this verse applies to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Not to the end of time. At the end of time, where will we be? We will all be scattered all over the world in, in the coming tribulation. And furthermore, in the coming tribulation, our safety will not be in fleeing from a city and making sure that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath. In the destruction of Jerusalem, it was important because the gates of Jerusalem were shut on the Sabbath. To those Jews who were locked up in Jerusalem, and, and, and I mean, traveling through the country on the Sabbath in, in, in that place where Sabbath observance was so strictly, was so strictly observed, there, 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 there were challenges and difficulties for any Jew who was traveling a significant distance on the Sabbath. So it applies to literal flight. It applies to literally running from a crisis. I think most of us are convinced that in, in what is coming, our safety will not be in literally fleeing on a particular day. Yes, some people are going to flee the cities and, and go to live in the country. I think most of us have it in mind to do that if possible. But, I, I, but still, we're not planning to do it on a, on, on, on a, in the middle of the tribulation. Those who are planning to do it are planning to do it. They are trying to do it already. Some are planning to go to Ghana or different places. But we are, we are planning to do it early. We're not waiting till a particular day. What Jesus was talking about was a particular crisis at a partic on a particular moment in time. And when they saw Jerusalem surrounded with armies, they were to flee. And they were to pray that, it should, that this didn't happen in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Our escape from Babylon is not that kind of escape. We flee from Babylon, but whether it's on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, our, our, move, our move is more like something that's, that takes place gradually. And it's, it's a move, primarily, it's a, it's a move of the spirit and of the mind, primarily. I'm not saying there's not some physical element that may be involved. You know, like I said, some of us will be moving to the country, but primarily come out of Babylon in the time of Jesus involved getting out of Jerusalem while you still could leave. The same call goes out in our time. Come out of Babylon, my people. But in this case, the primary concern is a spiritual exodus from spiritual Babylon. This is my understanding. So anyway, but, but look at the, 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 the context. This is the context in which Jesus makes a statement. He says, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the house stop not come down to take anything out of his house. This does not apply in the same sense in our time. And if you think it does, you are misunderstanding the prophecy. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Even though the end time crisis will come rapidly and suddenly, it will not be that sudden. You will have time to go back and take your clothes, pack your things and decide where to go. Because right now, I think some people are even, even, even making preparation right now. The end time crisis is not in the same way. And if we're not aware of this, we, we are confused about what is happening. So anyway, he says that your flight should not... And then he says, he says, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. We looked at this last week, and I go back to, I, I ask you again, does this apply to the destruction of Jerusalem? Or does it apply to the end of time? Let me just look, look in your right panel. In the right panel. Somebody saying something? It's the same. First you have to peel it and then you take it out. All right, Viva, I need to mute it's you. Business has gone abroad.
All right. Um, Revelation. Sorry about that. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, Brother Tony. Okay. Um, you know, I've heard many of answers to verse 20, but um, what what's your take on it? Why? Well, perfectly Why? honestly, I, 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 I know how we, we have interpreted it as Adventist, that it, it's because the Sabbath is still a sacred day. But um, I, right. I, tend to, I tend to lean to the idea. I, I lean to the idea that it's because it would be difficult to travel on the Sabbath. And I, I, I'll, I'll tell you why, because if it's a fact that it's a holy day, you know, if, if your life is at risk on a holy day, Jesus says you would take your cow out of the, out of the pit on a Sabbath. Jesus says you can, you can heal somebody, help somebody. Why would it be wrong on the Sabbath to flee for your life if you had to? It's like you can save a cow, but you can't save yourself. It doesn't make sense to say it's because the Sabbath is such a holy day that you cannot run. So on that basis, I, I would think that it's really because, you know, it's difficult to travel on the Sabbath for a Christian because in the context of the, of the time of Jerusalem, in the time when this was fulfilled, traveling on the Sabbath was hazardous for people, you know, because of the, the conditions. Okay, thank you. Yes. I like to said that, Brother David. Makes sense. And it, it would seem to say that some of these verses would imply to future, poss you know, possibly the future scenario and the present day scenario. Um, yes. Interesting that you said that. If you look at look at Revelation chapter seven, it's on the right panel, and verse fourteen. All right, I'm going to look at it in the NASB because in the King James version, a, a little word, uh, a little important word is missing. In the King James version, it says, "These are they which came out of great tribulation." But if you look at the, there's a little Greek word that I don't know how they how they missed it in the King James version because it is there. In the original manuscript, but it, what it it's, it's in the NASB, it says these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. All right, I, I I make a note of the word the because the word the is important. What what Paul what John is saying or what what God is saying because this is an, an one of the elders speaking to John. The people that he's looking at, which is the one forty-four thousand, they come out of not just great tribulation, not just any tribulation. They come out of the great tribulation, meaning that they they let me highlight it if I can. No, it means that it's a particular tribulation that is called the great tribulation. It's the same thing Jesus spoke about here in Matthew twenty-four. Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no nor ever shall be. There is a certain tribulation. There has always been tribulation for God's people. When Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, it was great tribulation. When, when it was destroyed by, by Titus, it was great tribulation. When, when there was persecution during the Dark Ages, it was great tribulation. <clears throat> but there is one tribulation that is such as was not since the begin, beginning of the world and shall never, ever be. There's one particular tribulation which is greater than anything else. And it says in Revelation 13 that the 144,000 are the ones who have come out of not great tribulation, but the great tribulation. <clears throat> there is a tribulation that is greater than anything that the world ever witnessed. And it is the one at the end of time. In the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter um, chapter 12, if I could just bring that up very quickly. It also says something similar to that. Daniel chapter 12, it says, <clears throat> it says in verse 1, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress, a time of trouble, it says in the King James, a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is written founding in the book will be rescued. Let me use the King James Version. That language is so 
unfamiliar to me. There shall be a time of trouble such as never, such such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time, at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. So this is the end of time. And how do we know it's the end of time? It's when Michael stands up and it says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting condemned. It's it's a it's a resurrection. It's the end of time. And it says, it, it, it happens when Michael stands up and it says, there shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. It's the same thing that Jesus says here, although he refers to it as tribulation. There shall be great tribulation such as was not since the big beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And Revelation refers to it as the great tribulation. Now, look at the transition, verse 20 to verse 21. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. What does that refer to? Well, we, we can see it says, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. It's talking about Jerusalem's destruction. Let him which is on the house stop not come down to take anything out of his house. The destruction of Jerusalem, those which are in Judea. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet is standing in the holy place. Jerusalem is surrounded by armies. So head for the hills as soon as you get a chance. Don't go back to take your clothes. Woe to those that are with child and to those that give suck in those days because women are going to be eating their own children. Pray at that time that you don't have to run in the winter or on the Sabbath because conditions of travel are very difficult. Now he goes immediately and he steps straight from there. To the end of time for then it seems to say at that time there shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world at this time no nor ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened now here he does not make a pause he does not make a break he does not make a distinction. He jumps straight from the destruction of Jerusalem right into the last great tribulation. And this is what I mean when I say that um, you, you can't just read it straight like this and think that it fits in one period of time. Because it is written in such a way that Jesus is answering the disciples' questions. And he's also, he's also giving you the prophecy in such a way that in every generation, there are three times when this might have been fulfilled, three, three, three cases. And, and each time when, when a Christian reads this, he will find consolation. For example, when the Jews saw Jerusalem destroyed, like I said last week, they saw one million of their countrymen slaughtered by the Romans. They saw women eating their children. They saw, they saw trouble like we have never seen. For them, the prophecy was being fulfilled. For them, they had consolation because they said, Jesus told us about this. For them, they had hope because they thought, this means that we are seeing the end of the world. So even though it, it was based on misunderstanding, yet it, it was a means of bringing them some consolation because they saw in these things a fulfillment of the prophecy. I mean, this is such a... a Yes, Nikki, let me just say something and then I'll come, come back to you. This is, this is such a, a challenging thing to accept that I, I, I want to point you back to something. This is the reason why the Jews rejected Christ. It's the reason why they rejected Christ, because when you read the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament, you have those two things mixed up. You have the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ mixed up in one. In some of the prophecies, they talk about a child being born and it refers to the first coming of Christ. And then in the same breath, it talks about how we shall rule and conquer. Same passage. So the Jews could not understand how this person could have been crucified on a cross. How he could have been a poor, suffering wanderer around Judea. So, so they, they rejected Christ because the prophecy was not able to flow in the way that they expected it to flow. They never saw the great gap between the first and the last coming of Christ. So. Anyway, th this is true in many of the prophecies. Go ahead, Nikki. 
Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking. So it makes it so difficult for, for us as we read to be able to differentiate. Um, anyway, for me, to be able to differentiate that which occurs or be, um, the interpretation in the time of Jerusalem destru destruction and, and, and separating that from what is to come later. Is there any of this part of it, you know, um, worn to those that you suck in those days? Your flight not being on the Sabbath or the wind um, during the winter is is there a dual application to any of this or are you just primarily um, talking about destruction of Jerusalem? Right, as as I was saying, I don't know if you, you just came on, but I, I pointed out a little earlier on that I don't think that this part that speaks about pray that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. I don't believe this applies to the end of time because as I was saying, I don't think our safety in the end of time lies in a physical flight from a physical place. God's people are all over the world. In, in, in Jerusalem, in the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, they were located in Judea, in one particular place. And, and Jesus gave them instructions because they asked, when shall these things be? When will, when will the, 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 the stones of the temple be struck down one from the other, uh, that there's not one left upon the other? And Jesus says, and they said, when shall these things be? And they, 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 they link it to something. And what shall be the, the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Questions that are separated from each other by thousands of years, events that are separated by thousands of years, and they didn't know. And Jesus never made them any the wiser. He gave them the answers, but he joined it together like one prophecy. So we who live in this time, like you said, Nikki, and I, I mentioned this at the beginning also, we would be confused if we come to this and expect to read it grammatically contextually and, and, and think that we could come up with a, a, scholar, a scholarly answer that a person can go to school and study and simply use comprehend, uh, normal comprehension abilities and figure it out. No, God intended that this thing should be written in such a way, should be given in such a way that it challenges people so that they need to have spiritual insight. Okay, without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you, you approach the thing like a scholar. So an, an atheist reads this, and, or, or an unbeliever reads this, and what does he say? He says, no, this, this is a false prophecy. This, 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 none, this never happened. And you say, well, it applies to the end of time. They say, no, no, no. It says, let those who are in Judea. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so for him, this is a reason to reject the prophecy. For you, you have, as, a, as a Christian reading this, you see clearly that Jesus is giving you the prophecy in such a way that he's covering two, two birds with one stone, but written in such a way that the answer or the interpretation is not superficial. You can figure this out because you have the Spirit of God working with you. You're a Christian and God is preserving you. So anyway, what I'm saying is that it's not supposed to be easy to understand. So if you say it's difficult, I agree with you. But it also highlights the point that understanding the Bible does not depend upon power of intellect, but on sincerity of spirit. So, you know, and so this is, you know, Jesus, Jesus said, God has, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and reveal them to babes and infants. So that, 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 that's a, a principle that is very clear in the way God operates. So, yes, Brother Ian, go ahead. I find it a little bit interesting that the disciples could ask him, it always come to, come to my mind, I always wonder about it, how the disciples could, could ask him what would be the sign of his coming when they themselves seem to have not understood that Jesus coming was going to come go away and come back again because they all were looking for him to set up the kingdom and and all of this kind of thing they weren't expecting crucifixion and all that kind of thing. even though he was telling them it's funny that they should ask him at this time that you know um, what is the sign of his coming if they had some understanding that he was going to go away and come back again. You understand what I'm asking, what I'm talking about? I understand. Um, 
in different in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, different ones tell the sequence maybe in a, in, a, in a different way. But the point is that, you know, from the beginning, he was telling them, he, he was talking to them about going away and coming back. But it's clear that they never understood nor fully grasped what he was saying right up to the end. You know, when he talked about dying and so on, they, they kind of heard the words, but they never, they never understood really that it was really going to happen. So I think they are listening to him again. And he says, look here, the time is, the days are coming when not even one stone is going to be left upon another. Now, when he says this, they know something has to happen, but this something terrible has to happen. So they, they, they recall his promises to go away and come again. And they are thinking, OK, this must be when he's gone that this will happen because it can't happen while he's here because he is the Messiah. So they, so, so they ask the question without understanding. But they have heard him say he's going away. So they figure this must be when he's, go he's gone, that this will happen. So then he's going to come back. Then, you know, so they say, OK, what is going to be the sign? When will this thing be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? They are using words that they don't fully grasp but because they have heard him speak of the thing before. They are making sure to put in their question. Now. Jesus says, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Now, clearly, again, this is an end of time prophecy. Why? Because in the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, Jesus says, there should no flesh be saved. This is this, this, the, no flesh doesn't refer only to Jews. This is a global event, this is a global tribulation. Something is to happen on a global scale that threatens humanity. And Jesus says that th that is a great tribulation and those days of that tribulation will be shortened. Why? For the elect's sake, for the sake of his people, for the sake of those who are, who are sealed, God will cut that tribulation short because he's not going to allow his people to be wiped out at that time. But it's clear to me, and if you, if you just examine it, you will see that it, this, is, this is a part of the prophecy that no, cannot apply to the Jews and to, and to the destruction of Jerusalem. Because if Jerusalem was wiped out, which, which it was, and if the Jews were wiped out, which they nearly were, if three or, or four or even 10 million Jews died, you'd have millions more all over the world. The, the, the destruction of Jerusalem was not a threat to all flesh. But the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, it, the great tribulation such as never was since the beginning of the world, this will threaten humanity. And this is why when you look at the time of trouble, the, the, this great tribulation, I believe we are going to see the ends of the world climaxing. I mean, the, 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 the experimentation of men with nature, they are already raising alarms that some things are threatening the safety of humanity but they they continue to experiment they continue to fool with things that they don't understand they continue to modify nature to to have genetic experiments they continue to re release things in areas where they don't belong and little by little the whole ecosystem of the planet is being disturbed they they they, they, are, they, they are using in, in america they're using fracking to get out oil, oil, oil from underground. People have been warning that it's going to cause the, the collapse of, of certain of those underground chambers. And um, they, they have been interfering with, with, with the weather. They are interfering. They, they, they started seeding the clouds long ago. They are interfering with the, the weather in an artificial way. They are interfering with things that they don't understand. They don't know how they work. The presumption of, who was it, recently was planning to, block out some of the rays of the sun to, to send something into the atmosphere. I think it was it Bill Gates or somebody was planning to, they, they changed their mind after a while, or supposedly they changed their mind. But it's inconceivable, unthinkable that human beings should think of interfering with the environment in such a way, except that when people don't believe in God, everything is just an accident of nature. And man must be smarter than nature. We must be smarter than nature. If, if mindless nature can, 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 can be working in this way, we can adjust it and we can modify it and we can make it better. 
and this is the the, the madness you you see it expressed when they um they're turning boys into girls and girls into boys supposedly they're working at trying to see if they can make a man have a baby the the the, the, the madness and the craziness is is the arrogance of the last days it's the arrogance of the last days and so obviously in the last moments you know the world is going to be falling apart there is a statement in the book of revelation let me just bring it up quickly it's a book, statement in the book of revelation that kind of refers to it i think it's it's in where is it it's in revelation um i think it's in 11 let me see if i can find it very quickly revelation sorry i don't want it on this side i want it on the other side revelation 11. um See, it says Revelation 18, Revelation 11, and verse 18. It says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, unto the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And look what it says, And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. There, there are little statements all over the Bible, little telling statements that give you an idea of what things are going to be like in the end of time. God says, God himself says the time comes to destroy those who are destroying the planet. This is a feature of the end of time, and it's in the book of Revelation, and it was there from the days when man never had a clue of how to even begin to destroy the earth. Okay? And it's not because people set out deliberately to destroy the earth. It's because they think they are God. And they start manipulating the planet and fooling around with things they don't understand. And the consequence is that the earth itself is, is on the way to destruction when Jesus comes again. So you will have, you will have the, the end of the world in nature, the end of the world in social structure, the end of the world in religious apostasy, the end of the world in humanity's rejection of God in every in every arena of human existence. It will be the end of the world. It will be climactic. And so Jesus says, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God will intervene and God will supernaturally put an end to it because if he didn't, nobody could survive. Now, it is in this context that he says, then, if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Now, remember earlier on, down in about verse 18, it did speak about false Christ and false prophets. Yeah, if you look right at the beginning, when it, just when he started talking in verse 5, listen to what Jesus said. Take ye that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This was referring to the, the, first, the first fulfillment in the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. There were false Christs in those days. There were people coming who saying they were Christ, and they deceived many. There were wars and rumors of wars, but Jesus says, but the end is not yet. However, now he comes back later down now and he talks about during the time of the great tribulation he says at this point he talks about another manifestation of the same thing on a bigger scale then at this time now in the in the time of the the, the true time of the end now not the destruction of jerusalem but the end of the world if any man shall say unto you look here is christ are there believe it not for there shall arise false christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders this never happened in the time of the destruction of jerusalem jesus is talking now about signs and wonders he says in so much that if it were if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect so what we are looking at here is very convincing supernatural events i i i know that in revelation it says that the false christ that the false prophet will even call down fire from heaven. But I think Revelation is focused on something else, okay? Revelation is not focused so much on 
the actions of individuals. It's focused on a system called a false prophet. And so the signs and wonders, the, 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 the miracles of the false prophet are different from these individual miracles of these false Christs and false prophets. Now, <clears throat> one of the things I, I, I don't know, and I'm going to say I don't know, all right? You know that one of the things that Ellen White highlights is that Satan himself is going to appear as Jesus Christ. Now, this is not something that I can verify from the Bible. The closest I can see in the Bible is where Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If you look at it carefully, it's not speaking in a prophetic sense. It is saying that, look here, Satan is behaving like he's somebody good. And so it's not a, it's not a surprise if his, if, his, if his agents or his servants behave in the same way. Let me, let me look for it quickly so, so you can see that I'm not misinterpreting it. It's, um, it's not Thessalonians, it's Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Look at what he says, and look at the context, and you'll see that what I'm saying is true. He talks about, he's talking about those people who um, are opposing the work he's doing, and he says, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. He's talking about people behaving as though they are, they are Christ's people when they are really Satan's people. And it says, and no marvel, it's not surprising, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's not saying in the future, he's saying right at this moment, Satan himself is behaving, is presenting himself as though he's doing good. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also, in addition to Satan, be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their work. So Paul was not making a prophecy to say that um, one day Satan would appear as Christ. He was saying that, look, Satan himself is behaving as though he's a, he's a good, he's an agent of good. So it's not surprising if evil apostles are presenting themselves as apostles of Christ. So in the Bible, I can't really find a place where it says, clear, it says that Satan will appear as Christ. But since Ellen White says so, okay, and I'm not going to I'm not going to say it is false, and I'm not going to say it is true because, I, as is my policy, I can't speak definitively. I won't speak definitively if I don't see it in the Bible. However, what I will say is that what you see here in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24, it could very well be. It could very well be that this is what happens. It could very well be when it says there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. We're talking about individuals who come along and present themselves as Jesus Christ. And these are not the ordinary little run of the mill. In Jamaica, we say, hurry, come up, false prophets. These are not the little run of the mill, hurry, come up, false prophets. These are, are genuine miracle workers because Jesus says, they shall show great signs, not just signs, great signs and wonders. And he says, these will be of such a nature in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive even the elect. And who are the elect? The elect are you and I, you and me. The elect are, are, are those of us who have the spirit of God in us. And Jesus says, it almost would have been, almost. But as, as, <laughs> As we, we also say in Jamaica, you know, nearly never kill bird, right? Almost, but not quite, because he cannot, he cannot overthrow the spirit of God. He cannot deceive the spirit of God. Our safety is not in our university education. Our safety is not in our ability to read. Our safety is not in our, uh, in, in our skill at comprehension. Our safety is in the spirit of the living God living inside each one of us. Satan cannot deceive Christ. When we talk about Christ in you, it applies here to brothers and sisters. God's people cannot be deceived. Jesus says, if it were possible, and you can imagine if, if, if even the elect are just barely getting by because God, Christ is in them. What about the rest of the world? 
You can understand from this perspective why they will hate you and persecute you because the signs and wonders will convince the entire planet that Jesus Christ is speaking through these people. Maybe even that some that's one of them or some of them rep represent Christ himself. And you stand against it. You will not accept it. Then if Jesus Christ comes down, you know, I've heard it said. I've heard people say this. If Jesus Christ comes down and, and, and show me, I will believe. I've heard people say. Then if Jesus Christ comes down and show you and you still don't believe, if they will stone you for falsehood, if they will stone you for lesser things, what will they do to you? If Jesus Christ comes down and you stand against him, you become antichrist. Well, okay, that is one of the things, all right? That is one of the things. And um, we know all of this will happen, even though it's not the end of the story, because eventually these, these, this, this false religious system is going to be destroyed. Eventually, I believe that in spite of all of this, atheism will still prevail, right? So, so there is going to be persecution, both from false religion and then ultimately from the beast from the bottomless pit. So, so everything combines to, to cause the greatest horror show that God's people have ever seen. We are going to be the objects of universal hatred. First of all, by Babylon, like the Jews persecuted, persecuted the Christians. And when they had had their fill of it, the Romans took over. And then they joined together until finally the Romans destroyed the Jews and the Christians escaped. This is what the scenario is going to be like at the end of time again. The, 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 the false, false religious system, Babylon, will be the enemy of, of, of the true people of God. Right up. Babylon will be working along with the beast from the pit. Riding the beast, according to Revelation 18. And, and this brings persecution upon God's people. But ultimately... Babylon will turn against the uh, the beast will turn against Babylon as well, and 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 the, be the Babylon will be hated, and they'll make her naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So God's people are going to be persecuted on both sides, but God will will save them out of it. Okay, so so Jesus goes on, continues to warn about these false Christs, and he says, behold. I've told you before, simple warning. You don't want to listen, it's your business, but I told you and I told you before it happened. So, so nobody has an excuse. When, when, when a false prophet comes along and says, the Lord told me to say so and so, and he shows a sign and wonder. Nobody, no Christian has any, any excuse for being deceived. Because Jesus tells you before, he says, look, I've told you before, therefore, if they say unto you, behold, he's in the desert, do not go forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. So clearly one of the things that will happen is that there will be manifestations where people say that they have seen Jesus or Jesus has appeared. Or they will tell you that if you go to a certain spot, Jesus has come back. He has come back and he is gathering his, 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 his people together. And you are to go to a certain location. Maybe. I don't know what will happen. But when you look at his words, you can, you can visualize certain scenarios. But he says, whatever you hear, don't believe it. Don't go. Because I've told you, this is what will happen. As the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What is he emphasizing here? A public and glorious display. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Do you know that there are people who claim to be Christians who say that this happened already? And you, you know I'm speaking primarily of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, most Christians regard Jehovah's Witnesses as being a cult, and many of them do not even regard Jehovah's Witnesses as being Christians. However, they do claim to believe the Bible. They do claim to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They do claim to believe that we are saved by the death of Christ. And, and, and many of the things that you know, we would embrace as Christians, they, 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 they claim to believe. So they claim the name of Christians. And they believe that Jesus came back in 1914. 
maybe Jesus was warning against exactly people like that because Jesus, Jesus says, as lightning coming out of the east and shines even unto the west. What is he emphasizing? I mean, I, I know that I just said that understanding the Bible sometimes does not does not require human intellect, but you 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 still need to be reasonably intelligent to at least understand what you're reading. It says lightning. What he's talking about is visibility. Because he just says, if you heard that he's in the desert, don't go. If you hear he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it. He's talking about visibility. If somebody tells you that he's somewhere quietly in some area, don't believe it. Because it, the point is, when he comes again, it will be brilliant and globally visible. And you have seen it, okay? One of the things about lightning, especially at night, is that it deceives you because you see the whole place light up. And if you if you if you look at the news, you you sometimes find that it is hundreds of miles away out in the ocean. Well, I mean, at least for us, for me in Jamaica here, the ocean is easy to because we have ocean right around. If you live maybe inland, it, you may not uh, pick that up. But sometimes I, I I live in the middle of the island. Well, it's not it's not really far. It's like it's maybe about. 30 miles from the ocean on the far side. So, but but many times you see lightning light up the place. And when you listen for the thunder, sometimes it's 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 much later you can hear the, the thunder, or sometimes you don't even hear it. It is so far away. It's hundreds of miles out to sea. And and you can see the flash of light, but it lights up the whole place. This is what Jesus was talking about. He was saying. The, the coming of Jesus, when I return, the hallmark of my coming will be global visibility. He goes on to say, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. All right, let me just comment on that a little bit and see if we can understand what he's saying. Um, you could look at this verse, you could interpret this verse in two ways. Jesus is talking about something being gathered together at a certain spot. And he compares this thing to a carcass. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about his coming. What is the carcass? What is the carcass around which the eagles will gather? Is it Jesus who is the carcass and all of us are gathered together around him? Or is he saying that anywhere there is one of my people, the angels will come and will find him? It can mean any one of these things, but I tend to believe that it is saying, Jesus is saying, anywhere I am, my people are going to be gathered to me there. Okay, so where the carcass is, he's using something in nature to illustrate what happens. You know, and when, whenever there's a dead body, all the crows, all the vultures come and they gather around that body. There's something that attracts them to that point. And so Jesus is saying, when I come, something like that will happen and all my people are going to be gathered together to me. I think that is what he means, okay? If, 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 if there is some other possibility, I'm open to, to, to hearing the thoughts on it. Sister Leanne, you wanted to say something. Well, that reminds me of another verse and I can't remember where it is in the New Testament. I think it's in... Oh, Thessalonians, I think, when chapter four, maybe, where they're talking about, um, I might have that confused. Anyway, the verse, it basically says um, that it, it seems to be saying that um, those, those who are on, unbelievers will be killed at Christ's coming, and I'm paraphrasing that greatly. But do you know what I'm talking about? Talks about. Uh, do you? Okay. <laughs> I, I I know the verse. It's um. It's Second Thessalonians one chapter one, and um. It says, "To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." Was this the one you had in mind?
Det var det jag vet. Jag inte som till den filmen. Okej, okay, sista hela. Sista Leanne, was this the one you had in mind? It's similar, but the one I was thinking of uh, said right. two it's men will be in it. Two men will be in it. It's talking about the man of sin who shall, then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Is that yes, the one? Yes. Yeah. That's chapter two and verse eight. And I know this is, yes, go ahead. Chapter where two will be working in the field and one, one shall be be, Yeah, is, is this same chapter? Luke is, 17. Yeah, it's the equivalent chapter in Luke. Thank you, very oh. much, Andrew. Yes, yeah, thank you. And, okay, it's just like when Christ returns, he'll, those of us who are his followers will be meet him in the air and those who are left behind will be dead is what that's saying, right? It's Absolutely. Like, so, uh, yeah, that's one chapter that, or one verse that the people who believe in the rapture don't like to hear. <laughs> Because it, they think that people are going to be alive and yes, still wondering yes. what happened, right? Right. So, so um, the the truth is that as you put the different verses together, you you take a bit from Thessalonians, you take a bit from Matthew twenty four. You take a little piece from Luke 17, a little piece from Mark 13, something from Revelation. When you put them together, you get a complete picture. Sometimes one passage doesn't give you the complete picture, you know, but the, the, the point of the Bible is that truth always harmonizes and the Bible harmonizes. Sometimes you find that there seems to be a contradiction and the reason is because you don't understand properly what is being said. But I agree, when you, when you look at all of the Bible, yeah, I'm coming rather large. When you put when you put the, the the different things together, you cannot find a secret rapture in the Bible. Go ahead, yeah. Lord. No, it's Peter. Peter. Oh, <laughs> sorry, brother Peter. Um, the text in Luke 17. The question was uh, was asked, where? It couldn't be where the one woman was grinding is, but it's clear that two shall be grinding together. One shall be taken, and the other left. So when I ask the question, where to? It must be the one that is left because one is already grinding. And he said that where the eagles are gathered, they will always be. So you refer to a while ago. I you kind of you kind of cut off, Brother Peter. You went very soft. I don't think anybody can hear what you're saying. Uh, David, can you hear me? Let, yeah, uh, sister, that's since he started. Let him just finish. Go ahead, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, hearing you now. Okay. In Luke 17, Jesus talks about two men grinding together. Okay. One shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? It has to be, he's, they're asking, Where? one the one that is taken where is he because if one is left they don't need to ask that jesus said wherever the body is thither will the eagles be gathered it therefore means that the text that you quoted in matthew chapter 24 where you say the gathering is uh, the gathering of christ and his people i can't see that i don't understand that i see the gathering of eagles around dead bodies people are dead eagles vultures i see that as not christ and his people but dead bodies that's what I see in Luke 15, and I figure the same thing in okay. Luke 17. I figure the same thing in Matthew 24. That's my understanding. All right, thank you, Brother Peter. I I see what you're saying. Um, I I, I, I yeah, I, I'm coming. Okay. Sister Heda, Sister Heda, Sister Heda is next in line, and then afterwards you can go ahead, Brother Ian. But it, the thing is. There, there's a little there there's some problem about taking this whole passage literally i'll just say this and then i'm going to take sister Heather. i don't think 
there is going to be a literal situation where two people are in the same field, one is taken and the other is left. I don't think so. I think Jesus, I don't think there's going to be a, a literal situation where two women are grinding together, one shall be taken and one shall be left. I don't think there's a literal situation where two men shall be in one bed, one taken and the other shall be left because none of us believes the coming of Jesus will be like this. Because we believe that at this time, there has been already a great separation. I don't think my godless brother is going to be in the same house or the same room with me because those who don't belong to God will, have, will be severely persecuting those who don't. There's, there's going to be a striking distinction and separation up to this point. So I think when Jesus is saying two shall be in one bed, two shall be grinding at the mill, two shall be in the same field, it's, 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 an, it's, it's, an, it's an expressive statement. He's making statements to show how you can't really tell the difference between who is saved and who will be lost. Humanity will seem to be in the same position until the final decisive moment you see who is saved and who is lost. So that is something to consider. But, but I take the point about um, they say, we're Lord, and he said, we're the the body is there, like, he can speak at it there. It would, it would fit, taken literally, it will fit more what you, the, the interpretation you gave. Okay, I accept that. But I still uh, want to add that I, I don't think these, these statements about two being in the same field, in the same bed, grinding together at the mill, I don't think that is going to be literally happen, so, happening. So we have to consider that as well. All right? So, uh, Sister Heather, go ahead. Yes, I was about to say the same thing that it, I always saw this in a, it paints a negative picture. It doesn't, to me, speak to Christ, being, you know, like what you explained. Um, it more, I was more thinking that um, it has something to do with the deception that he spoke about in verse 24. So I think this is really talking about like-minded people, gullible people will be deceived. Right, there is not, you know, nothing to do with Christ, per se. You mean where it says where the carcass is there, the eagles will be gathered together? Uh, You're referring to that yeah. verse? Yes, but David. Okay, okay, all right. But, Good. Yeah, but nah. if there was a question from verse 24, there was, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. So they were, it was talking about deception. So I think it's in that same vein, it's coming down to there. Okay. So the global and those people will be deceived, you know. All right. Yeah. So we can consider that as well. Go ahead, Brother Ian. Yeah, I, it was something along that vein I was coming to, I wanted to comment on. The word taken there, though, necessarily, especially in biblical writing, doesn't mean taken up to, to glory. It means captured or killed or, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean, it's not anything good. You know, when, when somebody is taken, when a city is taken, it means that that city has been conquered. So I, I think that's that's the language that is being used here. One is taken means, and it could be taken in a, in a deception, like Heather said, or it could mean that the person is killed, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on from that anyway, but as we see, there might be several possible interpretations. But I don't think it materially affects the passage at all you know the, the main point that is being made here's the main point it, it will not it, there will not be any clear-cut discrimination between the good and the wicked it will seem to be nobody can look at, at, at or the casual eye will not be able to look and say this man is going to heaven and this man is going to hell god's people will understand but to the casual eye Everything will seem to be on the same level because two men are, are working together, two women are, are, are in the same bed, are, are, are grinding together at the mill. In other words, G what Jesus is really saying is that people will seem to be very similar. You don't see any clear distinction. And what happens is that God, a choice is made between the both of them, whether it means taken to destruction or it means taken to heaven. The point is a, a choice is made that is not obvious to humanity. The fact about in the field, grinding together in one bed, what he's really saying is that hum human beings will seem to be the same. Outwardly, you can't tell who is saved and who is lost. That is what he's saying. 
human beings appear to be the same, and yet in God's system of accounting, one is going to be lost and one is going to be taken. That's the point Jesus is making. He's making the point that you cannot, you cannot look and see that one set of people is black and one is white. One is tall and one is short. One, one set is Jews, one set are Indians. He, he, he says you can't look at them like this because they are going to appear to be in the same condition, except that one set, one, one will be chosen, those in a certain, a certain kind will be chosen, another kind will be left. So that's the point he's making. So, so the rest of it is kind of like, you know, maybe just padding material. That's the main point he's making. How does that fit with the mark of the beast and the distinction between the two class of people in the end of time? I don't see how that fits. That seems to contradict well, that. This, this is why when you look at different prophecies, you have to look at the point that is being made in the prophecy. Okay? Because when the mark of the beast comes, the people of the world, will they know that you are saved and they are lost? They I'm, might pretty know, but, but I'm pretty they, sure they won't. You will know, but they won't. But they will know that we're different from them, right? Because we're not going their ways. Yeah, but Jesus is speaking in terms of salvation. He's speaking in terms of who will God select and who will God not select. And he's saying that, what he's saying is that outwardly there's no, there's no distinction. And how does he point out that there's no distinction? He points it out by saying two are in the same bed, two are in the same field, two are grinding together. What he's really saying is that to outward appearance, everybody appears to be the same. But he's saying that God has, has, has his accounting system. And, and so to, to, to the surprise of, of, the, uh, of everybody are unexpectedly except to the people themselves who are involved. One is chosen and one is not. He's talking about outward appearances as opposed to what is a true state of a person. So this, this I mean, that, you, and the tears. Yeah, yeah, right. The wheat and the tears is a good example. The wheat and the tears is a good example. Because in the wheat and the tears, everything appears to be the same until the angels separate them. And this is what this is what the, the one shall be taken and one shall be left. It corresponds to the angels gathering together the wheat and the, and the tears, separating the wheat and the tears. Yeah, that's a good uh, illustration to bring it out. So then. In verse 29, we come to the place now. This is why I, I don't believe that these events happened already. You know, even though Adventists in general say that these things happened back in uh, nearly two, 200 years ago. But I believe that there are, there, are, there are things to happen right now in the very end of time. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, Adventists say that these things happened, the, the, the sun and the moon was darkened in 1780, and the stars fell from heaven in 1833, and the shaking of the powers of the heaven are yet to take place. And they come to this conclusion because they say that this great tribulation, this great tribulation refers to the dark ages. They say the greatest tribulation that ever took place was between 538 and 1798, the 1260 days of papal persecution. So they say this was the great tribulation because Adventists, of course, are historicists. They look at the fulfillment of prophecy in history. And if you look at most of these things as taking place in the future, they call you a futurist. And as you know, I don't really care what label you put. I'm interested in what is true. And when you look at, at the context that we have been going through, it's possible that this tribulation, the Dark Ages tribulation, it might have brought comfort to Christians of that time. They might have thought, well, yeah, we are living in through the Great Tribulation, even though it took 1,260 years. I don't think Jesus was, was meant this at all, even though, I mean, if you lived between um, uh, AD 1501 and 1580, you lived for 80 years out of 1280, you could have lived your whole lifetime without suffering tribulation. When you hear about the Christians that died, they happened at moments in waves, like the Irish massacre, 
the St. Bartholomew's massacre. There were moments when they went and, 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 and assaulted those that were not of the Catholic faith. And there were moments of great destruction. But there were times when also people lived in relative peace for decades and maybe even centuries. So what I'm saying is that it's kind of like, I think it's a, it's a stretch to say that this tribulation really referred to the Dark Ages. But even if it did, the primary application is clearly the end of time. Jesus is talking about his coming. He's not talking about uh, something that happened over a gap of 200 years. Look here. The tribulation, okay, the, the, the Pope was taken captive in 1798, so the tribulation is over. That's what they say. 1798. Then the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Well, that happened in 1780. It happened about 18 years before the, 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 the Pope was taken captive, if I, if, I, if I calculate right. Then, about nearly 40 years later, you had the great meteorite shower, the Leonid shower, that they, they say was the, the, the falling of the stars. And that was in 1833. And then you had 1933. And then you had 2033. We're almost there, 200 years later. And the powers of the heavens are not yet shaken. Brother David, those stars only, the fell the star only happening in the South United States and never happened globally. Well, you, usually, I, I would say it was viewed in the southern United States, but it, it, it was a global event because the thing is, the world is turning. So a, a shower, a meteorite shower means that the earth is passing through a, 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 a meteorite thing. So while it turns, it's passing through, right? So far, it would have been a global event, but it could only be seen in one part of the world based on the time of day. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's it was only seen by United, in the United States, nobody else in the rest of the world. Right, right. Right, there it was only seen, and it, it, it was. I suppose if you lived at that time and you saw the display, you might have taken it as a fulfillment of prophecy. I'm trying to make excuses for these people, right? And and they they, they saw the dark the dark day and the moon when it appeared that night seemed to appear like blood. If you are really, if you really don't have an alternative, you could accept it, or you you might because. Most of us did at some point or the other because we did not look to see all the other things that fit in. But here's what happens. It says in verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Nobody who lived to see 1780 and 1833, none of those people is alive today. They never saw these things happen. So there's a statement I'm going to read in just a moment, and you will understand why I make that point. Let me go down to about verse, um, verse 33 and 34. Look at 33 and 34. 33 says, so likewise you, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Look what he says next. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Amen. What is he saying? He's saying there's only one way that I could understand this statement. He's saying that the generation that lives to see these things happening, the tribulation, the darkening of the, the sun the, the, uh, and the moon, the stars falling from heaven, this generation who lives to see these things, you can know that it is near at the doors. And I'm telling you the truth, Jesus says, this generation. This generation that sees these things will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So I could never in my conscience conclude that the falling of the stars and the darkening of the sun and the, the moon turning to blood happened 200 years ago. I could never accept this except when I was a young Christian and I, I, I had never really studied th th this thing for myself. So I did accept it at one time long ago. But when you begin to study for yourself and you begin to drop the shackles and to think, OK, let me see what the Bible says. And I'm not going to go with tradition or what my church tells me. Then you begin to see things a little differently. And even when you go to Revelation, if you go to Revelation and you go to chapter 6, 
where it mentions the same thing. If you go to Revelation 6, it says, I beheld when he had opened the six Don't forget the verse that came after. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. Yes. In verse 12, Revelation 6, it says, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast at her untimely fig tree, and she's shaken up a mighty wind. It does not pause. It says, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is what it says in Matthew 24. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. It's the same thing. The sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Bang, 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 bang. No delay. No 200-year break. Same exact thing it says here. There's a great earthquake. Not the Lisbon earthquake. The sun becomes black of sackcloth of here. The moon becomes as blood. The stars of heaven fall to the earth. The heaven departs as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island is shaken out of its place. And what do they say? When this happens, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, the bondmen, they run to hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they cry to them to fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. It says, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? When these things happen, the sun is dark and the moon does not give her light. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. It is the day, it is the great day of the wrath of God. Now this happens right up to the final moments. And it says in this period of time, then after this, then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. That's what it says here. The mighty men, the bondmen, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain. They mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Nothing secret, nothing hidden. This is the second coming of Jesus. And it's unmistakable. There's no way you can look at this and think it's a secret event that happened in 1914. Um, Brother Tony is asking if these things that happened before, if they were types. I, I wouldn't refer to them as types. Because I think most of the types, you know, were before Christ. I, 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 the best I could say is that they were partial or secondary fulfillment. I, I, I agree with the principle that in the Bible, sometimes you have a dual fulfillment. Sometimes even a threefold fulfillment of the same prophecy. God takes one prophecy and it applies in two or three different times in different ways. For example, the destruction of Jerusalem, the first destruction was an illustration of the second destruction is an illustration of the destruction of the world. You have, you have sometimes one prophecy that applies in several different situations. Like I said, you have elements that are in the prophecy that, prophecy that shows you that it's partially fulfilled in one time and partially fulfilled at another time. And this very prophecy in Matthew 24 is an example of this. So if somebody says, well, could it not be that the tribulation of the dark ages and then the, the falling of the stars and so on, could it not be that this was a partial fulfillment? I will grudgingly concede that it could be so. It could be so. It could be a, a, a secondary fulfillment. And, and God put it there to comfort the Christians of that time. Could be. Okay. I but know, the, the, the one I am. Say, Brother David. Say that again. In, in, light, in light of what you just read, how, how can you say that this generation shall not pass? I mean, that just qualify, that just disqualify all of that. I don't see how yes. it could be any partial or, or, or whatever fulfillment. All right. But let me go back and explain to you. Remember that. Jesus gives a prophecy and he does not tell you where one generation breaks and where one prophecy ends and the other one starts. Everything is given to you as one continuous prophecy. Now, if, 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 when Jesus says that um, if you will accept it, this is Elijah that was to come. He talks about John the Baptist. 
Okay. It does not mean that John about, uh, that, that, that Elijah is not to appear again at the end of time. We believe Elijah is to appear again at the end of time. Yet if you read the prophecy about the coming of Elijah, I could bring it up on the screen right here. If you read the prophecy about the coming of Elijah, there are many elements in it that cannot apply to the time of John. And yet Jesus applied it to the time of John. What I'm saying is that when you talk about a partial fulfillment, there are elements that don't fit. So a partial fulfillment means that you only take one part of it and you and, and, and you, 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 are, you take this as a partial fulfillment. So as you said, there are so, there are so many things in, in it that would not apply to the dark ages, but some parts of it could apply, is what I'm saying. If you look at the um if you look at the prophecy of, of Elijah in Malachi, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Look what it says. Before the coming of the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the great and dreadful day of the Lord was not the coming of Jesus, was not the first coming of Jesus. And yet Jesus says this was John the Baptist, and John the Baptist didn't, didn't precede the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It is the last Elijah, you and me, the Elijah movement. We are the ones that will precede the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And John the Baptist, it says, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. I don't know how, up to now how, how John the Baptist fulfilled this. Even when it, when it talks about, in, in the prophecy of Joel, when it talks about um, he will pour his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And they said it was fulfilled at Pentecost. But in the original prophecy, it says, it says, and I will show signs and wonders in the heavens, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And it talks about the falling of the stars and, and the moon turning to blood at the time when he shall pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And yet they applied it to the time of the apostles. So some things don't apply. It's a partial fulfillment. So that's what I mean, uh, I mean, Aaron. It could be, uh, when I say it could be a partial fulfillment, it could be that if I were an Adventist living in 1833, and I thought, oh my goodness, there was a great earthquake in 1755. And there, there was a dark day in 1780. And, and the moon, when it appeared that night, had the appearance of blood. And a few years later, here's the falling of the stars. Look, the prophecy, everything is fulfilling in sequence. And the, the Catholic Church was persecuting Christians for hundreds of years before that. Look, everything seems to be following the pattern. It's, fi, it's, fi, it's, it's following the sequence. I could be forgiven for thinking this is a fulfillment of the prophecy. And, and God Himself, sometimes uses situations like this to bring comfort to his people, even though the, 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 the major application is in our time and in our day. So that's really what I'm saying. All right, I'm going to read verse 31, and then I'm going to stop because we have a few more verses that I will reserve until next week. And it says, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So uh, th th there's something, it's, it's clear when you read this, that this trumpet, it's, it's kind of amazing, but Jesus mentioned it so many times, but this trumpet is literal. It is mentioned many times in the Bible. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says um, in about verse, what is it, about verse 17. It says, um, did I do, what did I do? First Thessalonians 4. Yeah, here it says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Here it mentions the trump of God. So, so it's, it seems clear to me there is going to be a sound of a trumpet. It's kind of amazing because it's mentioned so many times. It's, it's interesting to me that God mentions this trumpet so many times. I am not sure exactly why the trumpet is so important because um, I think it's also here in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, let me see, is it 15?
let me see, let me get it. Yeah, it's here. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. First Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So clearly, one of the things that happens at the coming of Jesus is a very literal blast of a trumpet. So we Jesus is coming back literally. There are going to be angels, but he's going to blow somebody is going to blow a trumpet. Jesus is going to blow a trumpet with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. I don't know if he will literally blow a trumpet or you'll hear the sound of the trumpet, but clearly there's going to be a tremendous blast that sounds like a trumpet. And this is what heralds the coming of Jesus. And at the sound of the trumpet, his children will be raised up, his dead children, will, or his sleeping children, will be raised from their graves and they will be caught up to meet him in the air. It's interesting because it says, he shall send his angels and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Here he mentions sending his angels. But in, in, in 1 Thessalonians, it says, the dead in Christ shall rise at the sound of the trumpet. It doesn't mention the angels. And I don't think it's the angels that's going to be raising anybody. But I think what, what he will do is he will send his angels to greet the resurrected ones. As soon as they are raised from the dead, the first person you will probably see is your angel, your guardian angel that took care of you all your life. You'll be glad to see him. He will be glad to see you again because you were his, his special object of care for all your life. So the angels will come and greet you the moment you come back to life. You know, it's interesting because this is just a little passing matter, just a curious, a little curiosity. You know, some people were never buried. Some people were eaten by shark. Some people drowned at sea. Some people were burned alive. Some people's ashes were scattered in different places. Where are the angels going to meet those people? It's just a little curious question. I don't know. Because we always picture at the resurrection, you know, these bodies coming up out of the grave and the angels there to meet them. But so many Christians didn't die that way, you know. So the exact place where their bodies is, or the bodies went to rest, it's not one place. It was all over the place. Even somebody like, was it Wycliffe? I think it was Wycliffe or, or Tyndale. They burned his body and they scattered the ashes in the ocean. So the main point, you know, you look at the main point and maybe not the details. The main point is that every Christian is going to come back to life. And of course, when you come back to life, it's going to be at some particular spot. But maybe not where you, 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 you are expecting to see the person, but he's going to come back to life. Every Christian who ever lived. Because the point is, it's going to be a different body. It's going to be the same spirit. And when the trumpet sounds, the spirit, the old spirit, let me not say old spirit, the original spirit and the new body combine together and the person comes to life. And wherever you come to life, whether it is on top of Mount Everest or, or, or in America or in India, we're all caught up together in the air to meet the Lord. Now, here since is... Not, uh, since it's not the old body, we're going to get back. Brother David, it seems that the old body. All right, somebody cut you off. I guess it's this part where you're. All right, can't, can't, couldn't hear you, and you, you broke up. A lot of what you said, you broke up completely. I think something about it's not the old body. Okay. She said it's a new body with a spirit, and you just changed the word old spirit and you corrected it. Right. So, um, yeah, obviously, it doesn't matter where exactly you, you, you rise from the great, rise to life. It doesn't matter. It can be anywhere on the earth, right? The point is we're all going to end up uh, around Jesus. One other little difficulty, I, I'm just going to... cut off for a while here. Yeah, right. I'm just going to comment on this briefly, and then we're probably going to close off. I just, it, it's, 
and I, I know this probably might cause more questions and maybe people comments. But anyway, people always say we live on a, on a global earth. Well, well, let me take that back. Not everybody believes that. But for those who believe in, in that we live on a global earth, sometimes the question is asked, how can every eye see Jesus at the same time if um, the earth is not flat? That's one of the questions, you know. Um, I suppose you could ask the question, how come everybody does not see the sun at the same time if the earth is flat? Because right now we're having day, some part of the earth, they are having night. But anyway, to me, it, it, the, the whole concept of, of, of Jesus appearing to everybody, is it follows the same pattern as day moving around the world. The same day comes to everybody. It just comes a little later to some. And well, say, David. Yeah, brother Ray, let me finish, Brother Ray. I, I would say the same thing. I would say the same thing in terms of a, of a, of a global, uh, of the coming of Jesus. Jesus comes from one direction and his coming would appear, he, he would that, that he, he would move around the earth, like how the sun moves around the earth. It could happen in a moment of time, you know? So anyway, I, I, I probably should leave it alone because it's going to cause a whole lot of controversy at this point, but I just start to put that in because I know people have asked a question before. Go ahead, Brother Ray. Yeah, Brother David, if the first Adam was made a quickening soul out of the dust, so if she's uh, made flesh, how hard is it for people to understand that if we are born into the second Adam, which is a quickening spirit, that we are not going to be resurrected with these bodies? So it doesn't matter where the heck you are at, it's the spirit that will be called up for existence. All right. It's I think, so simple. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, sometimes even the things that we, we understand, it's helpful to discuss them because it helps to, to, sometimes when you see the picture a little more simply or a little more clearly, it increases our faith even more. All right, anyway, we're going to stop here for this afternoon because um, there is too much left in the, in the passage for us to finish it this evening. But um, we will, the last part of it deals mostly with cautions, to be careful and to keep our eyes open and it mentions you know it mentions there, there are cautions of, against being deceived and it mentions that we should keep our eyes open because when when these things come to pass we can know that our redemption is near and some other warnings against the false servant and what he will be doing so we we'll look at that ne next week but up to this point now we have covered the prophetic part of the passage and what i hope is that as we have gone through it together it, it may not be clear in every respect but at least we can see that it is true that it is a prophecy that encompasses several time periods at least two time periods very clearly it's not a prophecy exclusively about the end of time and it's not a prophecy exclusively about the destruction of Jerusalem. Both things, the prophecy deals with both time periods and possibly a third element as well, but definitely two, okay? So that is something that um, I would like us to take away from. Take yes, Sister Dad. Well, I was just thinking, and no. And it might not make any sense, but the thought came to me about the resurrection. People have been dead for hundreds, thousands of years now. They, their bodies don't even exist, just like the people who were burned to ash and their ashes are gone. So nothing about their, except mummies, except the Egyptians. I mean, they can still have some form of their carcasses around, but for the most people, for most people, they're gone. It's just nothing. So, and if they're going to get new bodies and their spirit is being removed, is has been um, reserved in heaven, even though not living alive like people think, but it's re it's re preserved, mm -hmm. and it has to be united. But it's going to be reunited not with what went in the grave. 
it's going to be you put in another so how how it i'm wondering then why is it necessary to call it a resurrection when he's actually bringing with him and i think that's what that verse means if he's bringing with him that reserved spirit of us to you reunite in a new body that he is now going to create i mean i understand the resurrection because jesus did it as an example so we know but i just now just started to think it's just now not making sense in terms of that to me you understand what i'm saying yes because usually the resurrection means the restoration of the body that already was there so i understand yeah. It's the use of a terminology. I suppose the best way we could interpret it is to interpret the resurrection to mean the restoration of consciousness and life. So if we interpret resurrection in that way, then I guess it could fit. But if we think of it in terms of the restoration of the body, then absolutely you're, you're, you're quite right because what we will receive has nothing to do with what we once had in terms of and the, the body. people who were re and the people who were re the people who were resurrected before of course they had their old bodies it was just them coming back to life at that time but the resurrection for us is something different absolutely so yeah it's them having their bodies and those people uh that Christ raised like uh Moses all of that's so temporary for them because in order to re, to retain that, our situation, we have to make, Christ, should I say, had to do what he had to do for them to even retain that. And then they then would have to be changed also, wouldn't they? Wouldn't yes. that, yeah, that, that what they have now would have been temporary for them before Christ. Isn't yes. that right? Yes. I mean, Paul makes it clear, he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So absolutely, everybody who ever has a permanent place in that, in that new, uh, new world, new kingdom, has to have undergone this change. And even though Jesus came from the grave and his body is missing, it's clear it was a different body. I, I, I mean, I don't know what kind of miracle took place i don't know if the molecules and the atoms were transformed but look the body jesus died with could not go through walls it could not it be invisible. yeah so i don't know if the old body just dissipated or or miraculously it was changed into something different but the material was different and um i i guess we will experience it because paul says we shall be changed in a moment the twinkling of an eye so something similar will happen to us because we will have the body and we, where will the body go? It will change. And those who have no body and they are just a spirit, they will get a, 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 a brand new body out of whatever the new body is made out of. The old one will be gone, eaten by, to, turned to dust and blown away with the wind. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Brother Tony, go ahead. Uncle David. No, brother, that's exactly, no, that's exactly what I was gonna say. First Corinthians 51. You know, we should not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment. So, I mean, you know, it do seem like like our old bodies will still come up somewhere, and they will be changed in a moment. Um. Well, uh, brother Patrick and then Dario, but uh, what it says, brother Tony, is that um, it says the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with, to, with them. It, what I understand and what the, the passages seem to say is that the dead will be raised already incorruptible. Uh, I, I, it's not really conceivable that they will be raised in a corrupt state and then changed. And it wouldn't make sense either. So they are raised with the new bodies while we who are alive and remain shall be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So... Um, so That's the change I, might happen in the grave, huh? Well, the thing is, I don't think they are in the grave. Uh, like, like Sister Diane said, I mean, and like, like we pointed out earlier, the, the pieces and the parts, they don't exist right, anymore. Right, right. You know, yeah. we, we are made up of atoms. And what was once the, the body of somebody generations ago, maybe a part of my body, 
as, as gross as that seems, but you plant a tree, the roots go down into the ground and they, they, they pick up the, the nutrients that made up somebody's body and it bears fruit and you eat it. Fish eat people, you catch a fish and you eat the fish and those, those particles become a part of the body. We, you know, we are not those <laughs> atoms. As a matter of fact, every two years, they say, every cell in your body changes out every between two to five years so in five years you're a different person you have a different body so so our body is really not except, us at all. except the brain cells except the brain cells they say but now they're even saying that those are are renewed also over time but they, they once i said they never change but i heard differently recently brother patrick and then dario okay good afternoon or oh, evening wherever we are um two questions number one during the period of um, false Christ and false prophets, is, pro is probation closed? Well, based on the context of Matthew 24, I would say in Matthew 24, yes. Because it says that if I remember, if, if we see the sequence correctly, let me just bring that up very quickly. I think it says after the tribulation, or was it before the tribulation? Maybe it was before. Maybe I have the sequence a little bit wrong. Let me just bring it up quickly and look at it. Um, it says, all right, it says, then shall be great tribulation, okay? And except those days shall be shortened, nobody shall be saved. And he says, then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, Christ, or here or there, believe it not, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. So, in the context of this passage, it seems that the false Christ arise after the great tribulation. So, I would say that at this point, yes, grace is over, probation is closed when he talks about these great false Christ and false prophets. And I would modify that by saying we know that already we are seeing false Christ and false prophets, but so, so it, it, it's, it's like the, it applies to a period of time. But I think what we can conclude is that the greatest manifestations of these miracles and signs and wonders will be after the end of that tribulation, which should be after the close of probation. Okay, thanks. And second question is, or well, that's not my question. Apart from, I think, Matthew 8 and 10, where else in the Bible do we get the idea that we have guardian angels? Well, there, there are a, a couple, in, um, like, like in Psalms, for example, in the Psalm it says, the, the, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and deliver at them. And um, there is also, uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent to minister to those who shall be ears of salvation? So it does talk about angels protecting and ministering to God's people. And um, again, in Psalm 91, it says, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So I think, I think those are some of the verses that when you combine them together, Brother Patrick, I mean, it kind of leads to the, led, led to the conclusion and leads to the conclusion that there are angels protecting God's people. Thank you, Brother David. You're welcome, Brother Patrick. Go ahead, Dario. Okay, Uncle David. Um, as far as um <clears throat> the new body is concerned, or you know, transformation when Jesus comes. Um, didn't Jesus what didn't Jesus say after his resurrection? He said to one of his disciples, um, to touch him and feel him, it is him. A spirit had not body. I, I don't know if you mentioned this in this meeting. I came in late, but a spirit had not body or flesh or, or like me, and his scar was visible. Isn't it wasn't Jesus? Um. So it, is it? Would it be? Uh, what I want to say now? Would it be far fetched to say that it would be a different type? of combination of spirit and body like jesus was for for us um let, let, let me let me just point out something three 
three heavenly beings came to visit Abraham and they ate food. They, they, they ate a meal with Abraham. Two of them were angels and we believe one of them was the Lord Jesus in his heavenly form. Okay, somebody's going to correct me and say it wasn't Jesus, he was Michael. You are correct, all right? But anyway, just so we can identify who the person is, I said that. Now, they, they ate food. I'm sure angel, uh, Abraham could touch them and feel them. Heavenly beings have a quality. Spiritual beings have the quality of being able to materialize themselves so that they can be, they can appear as in, in, a, in a physical form or what seems to be a physical form. The Bible makes this clear over and over. Now, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, was he a spirit? It says that the last Adam was made a life giving spirit. He's declared to be a spirit. But at the same time, we have some understanding because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Spirits have bodies, but the, the, the bodies are of different quality than the bodies that we have here. They have certain abilities that these bodies don't have. Now, when Jesus said, touch me and see that it is I, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see me have. When he says a spirit does not have these things, it is, it is true. I don't believe spiritual bodies have flesh and bones, but that's not what he meant. The disciples had an idea that a spirit was something like what we call a dopey or a ghost. That's what they thought about. They thought of a spirit as a disembodied being that floats around like kind of smoke. Because that's what most people think about when you see a spirit. Um, so they think it's, it's, it's like a form without substance. So when Jesus says, touch me, a spirit does not have substance like you see me have. He was, he was catering to their understanding of spirit. He was not saying, I am still just as human as you are, and I'm still in my human body. But he's saying, you know, push your hand and see, I'm material, I'm substance. Push your hand in my, your finger in my hand and in my body. I'm substance. I'm not, I'm not smoky, non-material like you think of a ghost. So that's what, the, what I understand him to be really saying. Like Thank you, Uncle. Uh, thanks again. Right. Um, the, the idea of this. Long while, Brother David. I think since the beginning of mankind, I think what we have done is we have inherited superstitions. We didn't create them. Anyway. Brother David. Yes, Sister Maria. Uh, I have a question about the the two the two women the grinding in the same place and one is taken one other is left so are they talking about the two churches because uh, women represent church in the bible prophecy right yes yeah and what does it mean when it said the two women grinding in the same place it, it, it i don't think in this prophecy it's it's intended to refer to churches because it's not a symbolic prophecy. In symbolic prophecy, yes, women represent churches, but uh, it's not symbolic. Even though it's it's um, even though it's representational, but it's not uh, symbolic. If you if you said the two women would represent churches, then you'd have to ask, what are the two men in the field representing, and what are the two men in the bed representing? I I, I just think what Jesus was saying, as I pointed out a little earlier on, is that people are going to be in their in their normal state to all appearances. You won't be able to tell the difference. It's like the wheat and the tears, as brother, uh, was it brother Ian pointed out. The wheat and the tears are growing together. They seem to be the same until, now when he says two women are grinding, women were always grinding at the mill. I think it says that in one place, they were grinding at the mill. They were always making corn. They, used, they grind with the, the, the mill or they grind with stones. It was the, the job of women to grind the, 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 the wheat to make flour. So women would be at the mill grinding away. And, and he was, what he was really saying is that women would be carrying on their normal activities and so would men. In other words, you don't see any clear difference between them until the time of the separation. And you see that God separates them east and west. And then you know that there's something different about them. So that was the point he was really making. Okay. And okay. what about, uh, and you said that two men because it said that two men are in the same bed. I, I thought that this would be, it's not talking about the resurrection, like one is taken. 
the no. first resurrection and the other one is the second resurrection? It, it, you, you know, the, 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 the Jesus always uh, expressed the truth in graphic ways. For example, when he talked about, um, he said, he said, it's like a man gathering fish and he gathered in the good and he threw away the bad. And again, he said, it's like, it's like wheat planted in a field and they grow together till the harvest and then the angels separate the good from the bad. And another time he told another story about the separation that was so graphic, you, 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 it's hard to believe it's not literal. He says, when the son of man comes, he will separate them like the sheep from the goat and he will say to those on the left hand and those on the right hand. And I don't, I, I don't think any of us really believe that is literally going to happen. No, when Jesus comes, he's not going to sit down and separate the world into two groups. And he says, you come and you stay there. It's a graphic story to, to illustrate that there is going to be a separation and a division and he's going to make that separation and there's going to be a, there is a criterion by which he will make that distinction. It's those who have been kind to their neighbors, those who have allowed the spirit of God to live in them and to express Christ through them who will be accepted. But he tells a story and the story, if you take the story literally, I mean, if you take his stories literally, you'll believe that rich men go to hell and roast down there and good men go to, and, and beggars go to, to live in Abraham's bosom. You don't take the stories. You take the meaning behind the stories when you listen to the parables. That's the main point. Sometimes there are details to the stories that fit, yes. But most important, you think what we are looking at primarily is the, the, the meaning that he's trying to get across, not the details of the story. And I think in this part where he talks about women grinding, men in the bed, men in the field, it's the same kind of principle. Um, Sister Lorena and then Brother Jerry. Is it okay if I ask a question a bit off topic or should I wait? Uh, uh, okay, let me let Brother Jerry go first in case it's on the okay. same topic. Yes, I just wanted to ask, is it okay to be cremated? Well, uh, well, let me just say this, okay? My father was cremated and so was my mother. And they both wanted to be cremated. And if I die, I would like my family to cremate me too. So that gives my opinion. I know that the thing about it is that people think it started with paganism. Maybe the Hindus cremate their people for some religious reason. I'm just very practical because I say, first of all, it's much cheaper. And secondly, I'm going to become dust anyway. And when you are dead, I believe and I live by my beliefs. I don't believe that when you are, you are dead, you're going to feel burning or anything. And your ashes are nothing because you're going to get a new body. So why on earth should I be concerned what happens after I die? But if it's cheaper for my family, fine, please cremate me. I know that burial in a coffin is traditional and so forth. But I, I tell you, it's traumatic in a way for those who are left behind because it's... Uh, to be buried with a coffin is far more expensive. And it, 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 you, you, there, there are so many things. But anyway, that's my opinion, Brother Jerry. I know not, not everybody may agree with me, but in my opinion, when I'm dead, burn me and throw me in the ocean, throw me to the, the, the vultures. The only reason why it might be bad is because my family would be traumatized. But really, it doesn't matter when you die. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Brother Jerry. Um, okay, who is this to Lorena? I, I wanted to find out, um, because I was having a discussion with someone about salvation, whether salvation is instantaneously or is it a, a, a process? <laughs> salvation is instantaneous. Okay, but, that's what I believe. But coming to that instant might take time. In other words, a, a, a person may go through a process until he comes to the place where he surrenders. He may go through a process until he comes to the place of conviction that he surrenders. When you surrender, God does not hesitate one second before he gives you his spirit. The moment you choose Christ, he gives you the new birth. Why should he wait one minute? Yeah. And, and, and jeopardize your salvation. As soon as you come through the door, he closes it behind you. But the point is, it takes a while to get to that place. There are people who struggle and fight and batter, sometimes for years, until they come to the point where they make a decision that I want Christ to take control. 
So that's what takes time. So that process is that process conversion that that taking the time to get there. It, would you say you're converted then, and you're you're no, going the other way? That. I wouldn't say that. I would say that this is a spirit of God pursuing you. People can oh. be in a in a bar, or, or, or they can be robbing a place, they can be committing adultery, or they can be in all kinds of evil, and the spirit of God is still following them. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, when I was a godless teenager, something something I can always remember. I I I was not seeking God. I had no intention of giving myself to God. My only intention was to keep far from church. Something strange happened to me over and over, and I never knew what it was until afterwards. There were times when I would get up and look out the window, like a, a particularly blue sky, or the ocean was tranquil, and something moved inside of me. I can't describe, like something in my bosom just turned over. And I felt a longing for something, and I didn't know what I wanted. I never could explain what I wanted. I just felt a, a, a longing for something. And I had no intention or desire for God. And you know that after I became a Christian, I never experienced it again. Never again. Hmm. So afterwards, I realized that it was the Spirit of God tearing my heart and calling me, even though I never recognized it. You know, mm. so God, I, I would say the process is the pursuing of God. But there are many people who are, I would say, semi-converted or converted in that they have turned to religion. They have turned from that old life. But they still don't surrender or they still don't understand salvation. So although they are converted, they think they are born again. And for them, it's a process because they are trying to get to a place and they can't get there because they don't understand that that place is, is receiving Christ. So they are trying mm -hmm. to they are trying to interact with God on the basis of my obedience and my, my conformity. And they don't realize that the way is a process of giving up myself. But the moment a person gives himself to Christ in sincerity, he's born that moment he's born again. It's an instant. But mm -hmm. the preparation sometimes takes time. I see. Thank you. Okay, Sister um, Larina. I see we Brother Joshua. All right, I see Brother Joshua, then Sister Diane, then Sister Maria, then Brother Ian, in that order. Uh, yes, sir, Brother David. I just want <clears throat> to agree with you that um, it's it's instantaneous. It's, it's, it's boom. It's right away. I just want to encourage Sister Larina to keep trying. Uh, keep pursuing if she hasn't achieved it as yet, because when it happens, she's going to know it's going to be like night and day. Boom. You, you're changing an instant. You don't sin anymore. And every description that Paul gave in the New Testament concerning it is true. And you live it every day, every second of your day. So, yeah, keep going, Sister Lorena. Yeah. Thanks, Brother Joshua. And it may not even be Sister Lorena because it was a discussion she was having with somebody. So yes, uh, that's right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, did I say Sister Diane next? I think it was Sister Maria next. I said. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I I had just a question. I think this is from last week's uh, topic or discussion. It could be this morning. Anyway, I just have I just have uh wants to clarify about uh before uh law was given from adam to moses uh, adam to moses you said that the sin was in the world but sin is not charged to to them because there wasn't law any given right but is that mean that those people are saved just for example when when uh god told uh saul to kill the amalekites but he did not kill but god told him to kill even the babies or the animals and everybody has to be the you know young women children and also the the and also the the people in the sodom and gomorrah because even though their their practices is simple it's because there wasn't any law given so it, it could it be that they will be saved on the the resurrection is my question okay thanks for the question just uh, maria it's a, it's a it's a good question 
the thing is, the, here's what I would like us to settle. It, it's 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 the it's the reason why people have a problem with the things we believe. And here's the question: Are sinners going to die because they are guilty, or because they are corrupt? Are sinners going to be lost because they are guilty, or because they are corrupt? Now, that's the question. And once that question is settled in our minds, then everything becomes clear. Most of us, including myself, and I, I was listening to a video this morning from Pioneer Health and Missions where they're they are, they are, they are, they are fixated on the question, what causes us to be guilty? Because they think salvation is just about whether you're guilty or not. But it, they, they, I've, I've used the illustration many times, and this, this, this transformed my thinking, and I think the thinking of many of us, you can agree with this, it is that we are lost in Adam. And we are saved in Christ. We are lost in Adam, not because we are guilty. I'm not guilty of what Adam did, but I'm corrupted by Adam, and corruption cannot inherit the kingdom. That's the point. Whether it is fair or unfair, it's the reality of the universe. It's unfair that Adam sinned and he caused me to, to be in problems. This is why God did something else that was unfair. And yet, fair, it's unfair. For, for, for somebody to die for corrupt people, it's unfair for somebody to provide life for, for corrupt people, for him to suffer to do it. God did something unfair to himself to compensate for the unfairness that happened to us. So we are lost in Adam, not because of my behavior, but because of Adam's behavior. This is, this is the key to the story of the two Adams. My condemnation was because of the way I was born. Before I did anything wrong, I was already condemned, not condemned as guilty, not condemned by the law, but condemned by the, 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 the law of life. I, I was, I was a, a, a corrupt being, a danger to the universe, and I could not be allowed to live. And therefore, my destiny was death. And so God provided a way to change my destiny by changing my nature. This is the gospel that we embrace and believe and this is the heart of it so i know you understand the system maria but anytime i touch it i always get a little emotional so it's not in response to you that i get emotional yeah okay thank you for today you're welcome sister maria where is sister diane so in other words they're not safe to be saved Nahum one nine would not fit if that were the case but what I was going to say, I had the same conversation with someone this week, Sister Lorena, over this issue of conversion and new birth, and I couldn't get her to understand. And conversion itself is just a turning. It's turning from one direction to a, oh, the Old Testament uses that term more than the new. And so you're turning, and there's degrees of conversion. There's degrees of enlightenment and you coming to God. You're coming because you're being drawn by the Spirit. But until you totally surrender at that 180 degrees, then you're not born again. And so then you can come very close. And that's why we see the troubles that we see in the church yes. because yes. of conversions and not the new birth. And uh, quoting Ellen White, new births are a rare experience. And we can understand why it's a rare experience because if you only teach about conversion, and for coming from one church to another, you know, coming from one ideology to another, and you come to that institution, I'm gonna say institution, because it probably happens in a lot of churches, then you get caught up in the legalistic ritual of your experience. You're yeah. converted. The spirit is, it's the spirit of God that draws you. It's the spirit of God that's even making you awaken to this idea of who am I, where am I from, or this thing that's qu you're questioning inside. That desire comes from the spirit of God, but it was working all of your life. You're just now recognizing it at this point in your life. You're now hearing that something is triggering it, that you're responding, you're hearing it, right? And so you turn a sermon, you hear a sermon and you change, but all of this change and turning in degrees comes from the spirit leading but you also working 
you doing it. You're, you're putting in the effort, you're putting in the work, but you're never totally surrendering. And I'm speaking from experience. You never put in, you never come to the point of understanding this total surrender. You love God. God is who you, you know, you accept Jesus as your savior, but your, your life now, instead of it being Christ in you, is you being like Christ. It's not you putting on Christ, it's you being like Christ. So you have your devotion or you eat this way or you dress this way and you measure this and you do, you're just doing all of these things and that's putting you in a right direction. And of course, then you're being propped up by others as being converted because your life, your, 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 and I don't want to just call it a legalistic life because some people are happy in that, you know, they love God and I love but you're still legalistic because it's so much of you doing it. And you have a problem when you think at the end of the day, it's like, is this really, am I really a different person? Am I somebody new? Am I that same person? You question it along the way, but then you get the pat on the back because you're a good, in this case, you're a good Seventh-day Adventist. You're a good, you know, you, you, you get, so then you, say oh okay and you continue with that but there was always that question so then the good seventh day adventist then will turn around with these terms justification and sanctification well this is a work of a lifetime so now i'm working for the rest of my life trying to be sanctified and when do i get to that point not understanding that the justification and the sanctification these terms that are just not necessary in the gospel because you don't see it in the gospel it's not, those terms are not necessary. They're just the, theological terms that muddy the water because the righteousness of Christ is the righteousness of Christ, whether he justifies me or whether he sanctifies me. The same spirit that he gave me his life and forgave my sins is the same righteousness that now can, has me walking by faith each day. Right. And that is the confusion, and I can't. I wish you write a book about it because I couldn't get this clear to her, because she was so stuck on her being converted, her doing this, her doing that, and not understanding the new birth. Were we talking to the same sister? Because like maybe we were talking to the same person. Exactly <laughs> what I was going through. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put, Diane. Nicely put. Oh my God. All right. Um, I, I think Brother Ian and then I Brother Joel. The and then Nikki. Uh, I wanted to comment about the ashes. A lot of the saints were burned at the stake. And many of them were ashes, so I don't see where it is an issue. I see Brother I, I asked the question what is Lazar Lazarus was cremated? <laughs> I'm sure Jesus would have raised him just the same. There's no limit to the God's power now, y'all. Don't we? <laughs> Come on now. He gonna he all dead. the he people that are burned. He gonna bring them back. He was dead and stinking for four days. <laughs> um, is is it, Brother Joel? Not too sure. If I'm not going to be hitting the hornet's nest on this one, can you hear me? <laughs> if you don't, it will be unusual. Why, right, Brother Joe? <laughs> well, you know, um, I have this concept in my mind, and um, I feel convicted that there is some light in it. And it, it stands in a little bit in op op opposition to what my dear sister Diane just says in some sense. Because I do believe that justification and sanctification as theological terms are very useful in us truly understanding what salvation is. If we understand it in the way in which it is particularly used by Paul. Um, David, you know I am having a problem with understanding salvation as being an event that happens immediately. Even as I understand being saved as an event, because I don't see being saved and having salvation in the same way. 
I think that we are indeed truly justified and sanctified as an event when we receive the life of Christ. But I do consider that growing up that we do, that we all go through as being part of the salvific process of growing up in Christ. I know there are some scriptures that speak about salvation um, that mirrors a lot of what it has to say about how we are saved. But I kind of have a principle where I believe you go with where the majority of scripture leads. And in my mind, the majority of scripture gives the idea of salvation as something that God is working out in us over time. Now, I understand how difficult this is because most people are hearing me say that have a hard time divorcing being saved from having salvation. But those very words, justification and sanctification, and a correct understanding of them is what I think, and I know I'm seeming to be suggesting that I understand what these words are saying, um, and I might be in danger there of being wrong, but I think it is what is allowing me to appreciate that the growing up in Christ, which is something that is the work of God in us, is what I understand Peter particularly to be saying when he speaks about us receiving the divine nature. As a result of this, we are going from one principle of the grace of God to the next. And it gets to a place where he makes the point that at the end of this, you know, we will receive salvation. I know you're aware of the text that I'm speaking about. So I, I just thought it would be important to share my thoughts here. I don't know if there's value in it, but I, I just feel strongly enough to believe that justification and sanctification as it is used as theological terms, particularly by Paul, affords us a greater appreciation and understanding of what salvation truly is. Yeah, Brother, Brother Joel, I, I understand you and I know we have discussed this, okay? And um, I, I, I'm going to comment in a general way without um, going into details. I understand what Sister Diane said and I empathize with it as much as I understand also what you are saying. The thing is that I think I mentioned this to you also. My experience before I understood the truth about um, the two Adams and what, and my present understanding of righteousness by faith, it was it was conditioned and it was steeped in the terminology of justification, sanctification, glorification. That was the perspective from which I, I understood my former concept of righteousness by faith, and I, I, I kind of figured that it's the same for most people here. So. There is a there is there is a mindset associated with the terms. This mindset is something that has been built up and conditioned by the, the use of the terms in the church, in the magazines, in the literature, in the in the independent groups. There's a mindset and a perspective. Therefore, the terms do not automatically convey the same meanings that you are, you, are, you are giving to them. They don't automatically, whether, whether the terms mean how you see it or how it has been used, the whole, the whole terminology becomes unpleasant. And I think I mentioned to you before too that I prefer to avoid the terms altogether and use the concepts because the terms, the, the thing is, when saying something only helps insofar as the person you are speaking to has the same idea in his mind. And for most people, justification and sanctification, it conveys the ideas and the, and, and the perspective on salvation that we have been accustomed to pre our present understanding. To make the adjustment is not, is, not, is not comfortable and it is not easy when you have been conditioned to think a certain way. I understand that you, your mind, is, is, is searching for, your mind is searching in a different way. So I, I'm not in disagreement with you because when you get down to technicalities, I believe you're right. But in, in, in common language, I believe in the common uses of language, all things considered, I believe the terminology 
it leads to it leads to confusion without a great deal of explanation without a great deal of explanation you almost have to redefine the terms because there are already definitions in people's minds and so i understand when sister diane says it's, it she just want, feels it's better to leave it alone and you know from that perspective that is that is uh, is how i, I approach it to I, I i prefer to avoid the terms but uh, but it doesn't mean that i disagree with what you're saying I'll, I'll just say this quickly i believe you're right david because your explanation of it is how i understand it and it is a simplification of it and what is important is how we understand it not what the the terms mean as much if we can understand it properly enough that we might explain it to someone that should be what we're really trying to do and not so much get a full hold of what the theological terms mean and i agree with you on that the only reason why i decided to say something is that you know when the statement was made about it's more the issue of saved and salvation that most the most that i have a little bit of that makes me a little bit uncomfortable I, I, I really do, and, and I might be wrong, and I hope that the Lord will help me to see it better. I just think that we're making a mistake in defining being saved as having salvation. And I know in some aspects it is true. I, I just get uncomfortable with it. Um, no. When I think of the greater understanding of how the Bible presents salvation against being saved, because I think there are two different things. All right, I'm going to leave it at that because if we, uh, I, I don't think we can take it on in the scope of this room. But and there are some other people who want to come in. But um, it's a serious issue and a serious point that I think everybody's going to want to delve more deeply into. But let me take the questions and then if people want to engage after uh, people have uh, after the other questions, then fine. Nikki, then I think Sister Lorena, then Brother Joshua. Yeah, um, just to, to add to that, I do appreciate what Sister Diane said, because those terminologies always seems to confuse me. But now that I understand better um, about salvation and Christ's righteousness, I realize that you don't have all the sermons that within Adventism, you have all of these sermons being preached about justification and sanctification. And not everybody try to put in their little input, but you rarely hear anything being taught about the new birth and i think that is because it's not fully understood within adventism because if you should preach about new birth then you'd have to deny the trinity because the new birth talks about your your life in christ and it, it spells out completely who the spirit is and that cannot be taught in Adventist, adventism so i believe these these terminologies are used to cover up well this is my understanding all of this but if it's just simplified in a new birth, then people properly understand and appreciate what this new experience is and not using these fancy terminologies to, to cover up what the, the simple picture of it all is. This is how I understand it anyways. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of like the, the overall experience of most people. That's why, you know, I, I tend to agree. Sister Lorena. Uh, no, my, my interest is now piqued uh, about what, Brother Joel was speaking about because oh. I just want to understand is he saying that salvation and the process of sal salvation are two different things? I, I didn't understand it that way. Okay, um, hang on a little, Sister Lorena. Let my, Brother Joshua go ahead and then we'll, we'll come back to it because I think Brother Joel might explain himself. But, um, but Brother Joel is very technical, and you might end up more confused. Just to be, just to be, um, <laughs> it, it will take time. It will take time for you to 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 get to the point. I, I so let me let Brother Joshua go ahead. Uh, thanks, Brother David. And I understand there's lots of smart people on this platform who knows a lot of Bible verses and so on. But this thing about salvation and being saved and eternal life is very very simple 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 no one needs to know to read or nothing one thing we have to understand our father is infinite infinite in wisdom and everything else and this infinite brain searched for a, a solution for us and what the only thing he could come up with is to sacrifice his only son and when we understand that kind of love that an infinite being sacrificed his innocent son for us 
the love, that love, when we understand that fully, we fall in love with God. We fall in love. And it is from that point of love that we surrender completely because we have nowhere else to go. When we surrender completely, 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 he comes inside of us like a whirlwind, like, a, like an atomic bomb. And it is over. It is completely over. That is it. it, it, it you, you're changed in, an, in a second, in an instant, in a blink of an eye, you're changed. And you're not the same anymore. You don't sin. You don't do nothing. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You are, con you are com and you have eternal life right there, right then. And it is over. And we don't need to discuss anything anymore. But yes, of course, we need to come on the platform and learn things and learn Bible verses and so on. But it's not technical. People who don't know to read, who know nothing about nothing, they're going to hear about Jesus. They're going to just hear and they're going to fall in love and they're going to be saved. And most of us who know the entire Bible, we are not going to be because we make it too complicated. It is very simple, guys. Fall in love. I just understand this love. It, this love it, it it destroys you. It destroys you, and when it destroys you, it rips everything out of you and puts something back in you. That it's amazing. It's totally. I know I get crazy, but that's it, guys. Yeah. Okay, brother Joshua. Um, thanks. And uh, you know, I I, I empathize with what you say. I disagree a little bit because I think. As long as people don't understand, they will always have to discuss. So, you know, I know that out of your experience, you are saying we don't need to discuss any further. It's as simple as this. And I understand that for you, it's clear black and white. But the thing is that I know you don't expect everybody to accept your experience as theirs. So this is why, you know, even though it appears like it's maybe sometimes unnecessary discussion, it has to happen because one of the ways people come to understanding is through discussion so just to just to clarify that a little bit and i know you didn't mean that we are to shut down but i think i, I just want to make sure that um we are we're not misunderstanding you so if you're open Gregory, um david for another comment but i don't no, mind no, no, if you'd rather not I, I, i'm not shutting down the discussion i just wanted to make sure i got the other comments out of the way sister Lorena wants to to hear more in depth um you, what you you meant when you talked about save versus the process of salvation so go right ahead um for me if it is by beholding that we're becoming changed becoming changed into what and how does this change take place let's forget glorification for a second i use a simpler term transformation is there a transformation that is to happen after we have been saved and if there is a transformation to happen, what is the purpose of the transformation? My understanding, and it's a verse that David um, brought to my attention, um, based on what Paul says his gospel was in Ephesians 3, verse 10, that the purpose of it is that we might understand the mystery that has now been revealed, and it's part of his ministry for revelation of that mystery to those who are known the sons of God. The purpose being that principalities and powers might see by the condition that the state of the church has arrived in the wonderful and marvelous wisdom of God. Now, if the book of Revelation, for example, and this is the simplest way, David, that I can deal with it now, I could go and start digging into the scriptures and make it a little bit technical. But I'm, I'm just appealing a little bit to your reasoning and not the scriptures here, you know, because as you say, I have a tendency to get a little technical and I apologize for that. I wish I had a, another way of doing it more simply, but that's where I am now in my growth. It's maybe a little bit too mental still on my part. If it is true, for example, that God does not have a time set for his return, but all the creation, including principality and powers, are waiting on the sons of God to arrive in the place that 144,000 arrive in where they, wherefore they might be perfect before God so that the glorification of God is accomplished because it is the 144,000 is what is accomplished in the saints of God that vindicates the name of God. If you believe, 
that this is something that is a part of the plan of salvation, the vindication of God's name, the, 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 the production of what the life of Christ is to produce in the human being, where we, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, have grown up into the fullness of the stature of a son of God. The fact that that does not happen to me, for me, it is because something is missing from the development of the body of Christ. It's in my mind, and I might be wrong, again, I don't think that God has a time set in, 13, in, in, in 2044 or whatever. I think what is awaiting the return of Christ is the maturity of the body of Christ. Now, if this is true, it must then mean that salvation is much more than just about me being saved. It is about what me being saved is to produce. And I find that there's a process of Christ working out his life in us over time. That is a part of the plan of salvation. Being saved, and I hear you say this many times, David, is just the beginning of the journey. So if that is true, there is something that comes after being saved that is a part of the plan of salvation. So it is for me just an issue of, in my mind, common sense and reasoning, that if that is true, then I can understand why the Bible can speak about justification and sanctification as being the gift that we have in Christ, even as it speaks as sanctification, particularly, as still being a process in other parts of the Bible. Because there is this work that Christ is building up in us. Now, I'll quote one scripture in closing. Peter again says that we are partaking of the divine nation, nature in 2 Peter 1, verse 4. And then he goes on and he speaks about us adding to what we have received in the divine nature, you know, these attributes of God, knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness. And he continues and continues. And then he gets to where he speaks about why this is important. He says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence in making your calling and election sure. For if these things... If you do these things, he shall never fall. For so an angel shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of God. Now, I heard your presentation on the kingdom of God, and I agree with you. When you are born again, when you are saved, you're in the kingdom of God. But there is the everlasting kingdom of God that is before us. And for me, the plan of salvation is about us being in the everlasting kingdom. So I don't see how... Thinking about all these things, I can then say that I have salvation. What I am is saved. What I have is assurance that Christ would finish what he started with me. But I have to be able to recognize that there is something that I am to do to bring glory to God that finishes the controversy. And so in my mind, when the controversy is over and Christ returns, that is how I am to understand and can understand and it makes sense to me that I have salvation. Um, okay, let me let me let me let me ask something, and then I want to make a comment. Um, listening to you, I think I even understand a little bit than when you and I discussed this earlier. I think I understand uh, your your position a little bit, but let me ask a question. If I said the experience of salvation instead of the process of salvation, would it make a difference to you? Experience of salvation and the process of salvation, no. You see both of them as the same in terms of how you're understanding? Yes, because the experience of salvation is for me, David, not, not just what happens at the beginning. I mean, for me, God fronts loads the plan of salvation in saving me up front. He gives me okay. everything that is required for salvation in Christ up front. The experience does not end there, though. Maybe I'm not answering the question you're asking. Yeah, um, the, the thing is, I, I see, I see the, two, the two statements as referring to something different, and I'm trying to understand um, your, your, your perspective a little bit. That's why I asked the question, because to me, the process of salvation is referring to something that is not settled and it's not over. It's not done until you come to the end of that process, where, whereas the experience of salvation is living something that is already accomplished. You experience it, you are in it. And you are simply going through the process of experiencing it, whereas the process is something that starts but is uncertain until you get to the end. That's what I understand. If that is what you mean. I agree with you. 
if that is what you mean. Right. But for me, right. the experience of it was not just what is happening at the beginning. It's the whole journey of it. Right. Now, when you talk about the process of salvation as opposed to being saved, here, here's, here's what it conveys to the mind. Our, our, this is the way I, see, I see, see the terminology, and I think I may speak for most people here. To be saved and to not have salvation appears to be a contradiction in terms. And what I think most people, uh, uh, well, what I, I know that for me, that distinction between being saved and not having salvation is, is such a gray area, I can't quite figure out what is the difference. I know you, you, you are saying that being saved doesn't mean that you are safe. In other words, doesn't mean that you cannot be lost. But in my thinking, it negates the whole meaning of the word saved. If you include, if, 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 I mean, it's, it's a given that you can lose salvation. It's a given that you can be saved and at some point you might be not saved. Okay, that's a given because we, we are always free to reject what we possess. But the use of the word saved and then to say that we don't have salvation even though we are saved. That, I believe, is a place where, you know, most of us will have a challenge in understanding what you're saying. You know, um, because how then are we saved if we don't have salvation? How are we saved? What does the word mean? I mean, it just seems to be a, 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 a word without any meaning. For me, it's not a word without any me meaning, David, because again, it is how I understand um, salvation, uh, well, being saved as being both saved and salvation as a work of Christ. For me, being saved is an understanding that the fact that I have given myself to Christ and I have resigned my will to him and I have accepted what he has done on my behalf has brought me into a relationship with him that is a saving relationship. You see, this is what I am concerned about. I am worried that we push too far and we end up almost in the place, you know, where the one save always saved idea predominates the mind. I understand that when I am saved, I am saved conditionally. That is the truth. And I don't think anything is wrong with saying that. I'm saved no. based on the fact that I remain in Christ. Correct? I, I, if I, I can agree. lose salvation, go ahead. I agree. Save conditionally, but here, here's something that you didn't mention in what you just said, and I think it is yeah. a key is a key thing that needs to be focused on. Being saved, I understand to mean that the Spirit of God has come to dwell in me. I know you believe this too, but if if, yeah. if we look at it from the terms of me accepting and me doing this, if you look at it in terms of what the humanity does, what I do, we miss the main point. Because what I do does not save me. What saves me is the, is, the, is the key element that the Spirit of Christ comes to live inside me. That is, that is what saves me. And I understand that this is what salvation means. It means that I have become united to the, to the life of Christ. Now, when you look at it from this simple perspective, that is a challenge. How, do, how does it become uh, uh, two different things, to be saved or to have salvation? Because everything revolves around possessing the life of Christ. This, it, it, it's important to say, this does not mean that we cannot lose this. It's important. And I agree with you because, you know, if somebody looks at what you say and they say, okay, we think you're saying once saved, always saved. You simply say, no, that's not what I'm saying. But, but it doesn't mean that it's not true that you presently possess salvation because salvation is Christ. If you look at it in that simple way, you can, you can understand why it's a little challenging it's a little it's a little difficult to, to grasp the distinction between both things that you're trying to present sister Lorena, go ahead and then um, brother joel back to you brother joel i understand what you say uh, about being saved when you receive christ and i agree with that can you now give us your explanation of salvation i i understand the saved part can you now give me your understanding of salvation now your definition of that Sorry, I didn't realize I had muted my, my mic there. 
David has said some things and most other reason. The main reason why I think the way and understand the way I do is based on listening, I think, and coming to an understanding that I think I find within what David is teaching. You know, David has made the point before that salvation, the plan of salvation, the gospel of Christ is not just about what is happening here on earth. It is also about what is happening in the entire universe. I have kind of bought into that idea, my sister. And so for me, then salvation is not just about the condition that I am in. It is about God's desire to bring the whole of his creation into the same place that he now has me in Christ. And if it is true that it is what principalities and powers are seeing in us as an examination is made of the two kingdoms, again, something that I learned from David, then for me, salvation is the whole plan being fulfilled. Now, again, I don't think we need to lose any assurance over what I am saying. The moment by faith you have accept Christ, you come into a saving relationship with Christ that I think it's very hard to lose. When you think of the scriptures that, and how Christ and the, and the Bible in general, speak about the kind of assurance. My hand is strong, I will never let you go. My father's hand is stronger than mine, he will not let you go. We can understand the firmness of the position where we sit the minute we are in Christ. But for me, salvation has to be the entirety of the fulfillment of the plan. The plan is not just about the condition I find myself in now. It's uh -huh. about my nature being changed that I am like Christ in nature, which for me is a process. It's a process of overcoming this flesh that I'm still in and fighting against. And then there is this whole universe looking at me as a son of God. And in the development that is taking place in me, something is happening with them that sees a coming together of the whole plan where everything comes back into uniformity. For me, salvation and the return of Christ is when this has been accomplished. When this has been accomplished is when the 140,000 receive the seal of God. Again, something that David spoke about in light of the Day of Atonement. You know, we say that the atonement is not finished at the cross. And for me, everything has to add up, you know, my sister. That's the way my mind works. I take all, all the pieces have to be there. We can't say that the Day of Atonement is something that didn't finish at the cross, right? But there's a day of atonement before us that is coming that involves examination over the lives of men and a finishing of what God is trying to do. And then to say that I have salvation as a finished product, when that is still ahead of me, it does not compute, does not make it, it's not rational, doesn't make sense to me. So that is my point, my sister. And I'm using a lot of words to say it. I hope you can understand where I'm coming from. You know, the best way for okay. me to do it is to show the scriptures, but that is a whole nother thing altogether. And there's not time for that. So I hope you can understand where I'm coming from. I, I do. I, I get you. Don't agree with everything, but I do get some parts of it that you're saying. It's kind of like saying, you know, I am free, but if everybody's not free, then it's not done yet. It's, 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 it's salvation includes position. everyone, not just my, my being saved, but everyone who Christ wants saved until we get to that the end, the end of when Christ comes. And all that is, you're saying, is including the plan of salvation, not just what me in my little sphere being saved. And when you look at the majority of scriptures, if you go to the Bible of where salvation is used, the majority of the time, that is the way in which it is used. There is some places where it is used also in the context of being saved now, but the majority of it speaks to something that is a process that is before us. Um, but Jerry wants to say something, but um, I, 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 let me just quickly quickly s s comment that um, uh, I, my on this, brother Jerry, you, you said there are certain things that um, I, I emphasize, and you know it's what you it's, it's the basis on which you. The, the things you mentioned, you know, I would refer to them as a part of the plan of reconciliation instead of instead of the plan of salvation. I think I think to some extent terminology is making uh, uh, is, is challenging us because mm -hmm. yeah. Sister Lorena kind of touched on it when she said, um, you know, the plan of salvation has to do with a corporate condition 
while selfish and she, she, she's focusing on the individual. And I, I kind of picked that up when you were talking to, because it, it seemed like you, you were saying that for an individual, my individual salvation is not the end of the story, not until the corporate body and not until the whole universe, the process is completed, is the whole thing of salvation. And when you, uh, over, and when you were saying it, I was thinking, but probably I would use the word reconciliation to refer to that process rather than salvation, because salvation, I understand it with my individual status before God, my status before God. And the greater issue of my life now being a part of the process of glorifying God and bringing the universe back together. I was thinking that the Bible refers to it as reconcile. He died to reconcile all things to himself. We were reconciled. Uh, you know, I, so I thought maybe perhaps the word reconciliation might might add some some clarity to what you're saying. But um, before before I, you I appreciate what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. All right, all right, go ahead. Uh, Brother Jerry wants to say something, but go ahead. No, just that for me, uh, reconciliation, propitiation, um, for me, all are speaking about the same thing. It is what the plan of salvation is about. And so for me, David, using reconciliation does not, in my mind, change the point that I'm making. It's reinforcing the point that I am making. Because right. there's a ministry of reconciliation that we have received in Christ. In that is to accomplish the finished work which is us being like Christ in nature. So I, 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 again, the beauty of, of, of what it is that I have learned from you is that my condition in terms of where I'm, I'm in Christ is not based on that process being finished. It is not based on the process being fish, finished, right? Mm -hmm. So it is. I understand what you're saying, but again, I don't just see it about being about man. For me, salvation, in terms of what it carries in the majority of scripture, speaks of the whole plan, not just as it affects man in terms of where we stand in Christ. Yeah, I think I think where 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 the difficulty lies in probably to some extent the way that we understand the words that are being used, and um, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of goes back to the to what Sister Diane said at the beginning about avoiding a sanctification and justification because we can use the same words and, and have slightly different meanings which can make a great difference sometimes but let brother jerry go ahead he has been waiting a while yes because i i'm 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 dizzy i'm like <laughs> exhausted when when i look at the bible and what jesus tells me i'm pretty simple let this mind be it says let this mind be in you that's also in christ jesus he says let it and he wants us to enter into his rest i don't see rest here i'm tired out there's no rest he that he that began a good work in you so J jesus is doing the work in us We're, we have nothing to do with it it's by faith that jesus and the wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hear the sound thereof, and canst not tell when it came or when it goes. Same as everyone is born of the Spirit. We don't know when, when, when you're born of the Spirit, but when you, I think, if you're, if you're uh, maybe should I should not go this way, but if you're under the law, I don't think you could be born again, because if you're under the law, you're under the curse of the law. So if you're under the curse of the law, how can you be born again? So it's when I think it's when God sees that you have an understanding of him taking over the wheel. He's driving. It's not you. Believe it and let it be. That's it. God's doing the work. It's simple as that. It doesn't have to be all this jiggle jaggle, you know, all over the place. I mean, it's just confusing. Here is why, and I'll say this and then I'll stop. I'll, I'll, I'll stop, David. Last comment, guys. Why it is I feel this way is that I believe that if it was just about the way we understand the gospel now, if it is true that God's purpose is for us to know as we are known, if it is true that the love of God and the development of the Spirit in us is for us to be in a place where we can judge and discern and to understand things that are involved here right if this is true 
then my understanding is that the sons of God have not gotten to a place where they're seeing through the glass clearly. There are details within the plan that is more than the simplification of what you just said, which is true. And I understand that the simplified version is enough for us to come into a safe relationship. My point, though, is that if it is true that what God is after is that we are to know in a way that finishes his transforming work in us, then there are things beyond the simplification of it that is important for the finished product. That's all I'm saying. It's that maybe my brother, I am using too much reasoning. Maybe I'm being too complicated. But when I look at it, I don't have any way of understanding it. Because what I'm left with, if I'm not right about this, that the details are important, is that God has an abstract time for his return. That is just his time to return. And it is not that we have not yet attained to the nature of Christ in its fullness why he has not returned. So I, I'll leave it on that. Thank you, though. I appreciate everybody's patience in hearing me out. Okay, Brother Gerald, and thanks for the patience in trying to explain as well. I think Sister Iris, go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. Um, okay, I would just like to, it, it, to me, it depends on how you're saved. We're saved not by ourselves, or our works, or what we know. We're saved by Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation. And if he's in our heart, and I would say that if all of us are on this phone this late discussing this, he is definitely in our heart. This is not fake. Um, and so this whole terminology about the justification, if it is a gift of salvation, salvation is instant. It would seem like justification of it is instant, no matter what we've been taught. Sanctification means you're set aside for a holy purpose in our hearts. And by his purpose, it seems like we are. Now, glorification, I was told, was what happens when Jesus comes. But then when you when you read um, in John 17, he's asking the Father, glorify thou me. And it seems like he's asking that so that he can glorify the disciples, which maybe that means us as well. Um, it just seems like accept him. Don't get confused. We do know that maybe somebody came up with all these terms, <clears throat> not saying, or they, uh, these terms were used to catch us in that legalistic mindset. So we, oh, I've got to keep doing this so I don't get lost. So I have to keep doing this. So, uh, you know, I'll make it with, with the ship of Zion that's going through, no matter how ridiculous things are. Uh, it's just about Jesus Christ. Now, as far as ascending and all of that, uh, I think it says somewhere in First John, if you say you have not sinned, you, you're a liar. And maybe I'm taken out of context. Forgive me if I am. And Brother David, I guess you could correct me. I'm sure you could. It's just knowing that it is about us and Christ. If Christ came back right now, he just came back. And the only person ready would be Brother Joel. He'd take him. But he is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have him. We're just learning. And by his mercy and his grace, we will be learning for the rest of time. Uh, Brother Jerry, don't get confused. And Brother Joel, the Lord loves you so deeply and so dearly. I know I'm always saying that, but we just can't fall into that trap of words. We can't do that because that's what that's what some people want us to do. And we cannot work our Jesus has, he wants us to be saved. We he has paid that that debt for us. We have accepted the gift of salvation. So we do not belong to the first Adam. We belong to the second Adam. Amen. Okay, th thank you, Sister Iris. And um You're welcome. Uh I, I know I know that the real the real issue here is that I, I mean I, I'm kind of sitting back and looking and I'm kind of figuring out um how everybody's mind is working i know that i know that the real thing is that brother joel has his mind is more 
complex, complex. It works in a more complex way than the average person. He, 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 he wants to explain and factor in every single detail. And that is a huge task. And until you have everything simplified and able to clearly and simply explain what you're saying, you will always have challenges. And, 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 and that's part of the, the, the reason why um, Brother Jurel sometimes meets upon a stone wall because sometimes what he understands is not is not sim is not it's not simplified enough in his own mind for him to simply express it. So I kind of understand where he's coming from and I get I get the gist of what he's saying. But I understand why it's a little challenging for most of us to get it. I mean for most people I hear what you're saying and, and, and it kind of uh, it, it pleases me because everybody is saying it's very simple and, and the simplicity is Jesus. And I know I know all of us, including Brother Joel, we agree with that. And from that perspective, it's kind of like liberating to know that I throw myself into the arms of Jesus and I leave the complications behind and it is over. And um, I think that satisfies and, and meets the needs of everybody. Now, I understand also, I have a need and Brother Joel has that need and maybe even to, to a, a worse degree than I do to understand details and to be able to explain details and to sort out every little thing. Until we get everything clear in our own minds, it will always be challenging to um, express it adequately. So I think we have to leave it there. That Sister Diane, you can probably have the last word. Okay, I was thinking, it just dawned on me when we were talking about glorification, hopefully I'll lighten this up. <laughs> when I taught the sanctuary, it didn't dawn on me. I mean, I taught it that the outer court was justification, the, the first apartment was sanctification, and uh, the, la the, the most holy place was glorification. And it didn't dawn on me what I was saying because what the church was teaching that glorification came after the coming out of the, oh, the, 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 the other apartment, the second apartment. But the way the illustration taught it was justification, sanctification and glorification. So the glorification can comes before he returns. But it didn't dawn on me, even though I was teaching it. So you cannot, you cannot ever put away learning and discussing because things come out. Because for here I am teaching something that I myself didn't quite understand, and it wasn't until Brother Howard brought it to our attention in his studies that glorification comes now that it took me back to that those studies that I did on the sanctuary. And was teaching that very thing that I did myself didn't understand. So I just think it's interesting because, you know, as we, as I learn, I come to more truth. I'm not the type that's learning and never coming to truth. You know what I mean? I'm learning. And even though those things that I've had to, it, it's just amazing to me. And if I hadn't, if I don't continue to study and learn and whatever, that would have escaped me. You see, and I would have still been in a in a in a in a in a, in a wrong place. But I also just wanted to say that um, salvation is personal, and Jesus is a personal Savior, and we just uh, the gospel is supposed to be so simple that a child can can understand it. That's why I was saying about the terms not being. They're not that they're wrong or anything, but not necessary for the gospel. If anybody had a mind that was like Joel or even more, it would be it would be Paul. You know, I mean, obviously the way he wrote and the things that he said, you have to go back and study. You have to continue to dig to try to understand what he's saying. And it's there for, our, for a reason. And I hope my little fella recognizes me. <laughs> now He's beautiful, I isn't he beautiful? <laughs> I can't reach out and touch him like I wanted to. <laughs> yes, he's beautiful. He's a sweetheart too. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we just got to remember we're not saved corporately. 
were saved individually. And we, as we learn, we want to get to the place that we can teach this gospel to the world. That's our goal in, in life is to give this true gospel. He says, because if this gospel preached, then he'll come. So what gospel? And a lot of people, you know, of our background, we thought it was just teaching about the Sabbath and teaching about, you know, coming to the, but this is the gospel. The kingdom of God, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And we've got to be able to share that with everyone we come in contact with, whether it be an unbeliever or whether it be a Sunday keeper or a Seventh-day Adventist. This is the gospel. And this is what we need to teach them in a way that they can come to Christ and be saved or saved or whatever Amen. we're going <laughs> to Amen. 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 If you add anything more to it, if you add anything more to it, it's spoil. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> and and all the church say amen. And the church amen. said amen. 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 I don't know where I'm going to end this video when I'm posting.